good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Finance, Audit and Risk Committee meeting of Tuesday, 13th of August 2019, scheduled for start at 9 a.m., so 9.02 is not bad. Please be aware this meeting is being live streamed, and for those who are not watching it live, you can watch it later on YouTube. Members, please speak clearly into the microphone and please only one person at a time. And please turn off your mobile phones. Thanks, Bill. Um, first item, call for any apologies. I have an apology from Anthony Ruinui. He has another place he needs to be at, so he's given his apologies for the meeting day. Are there any other apologies? Okay, so I'll move that the apology be accepted. Second to Councillor Larry Baldock. All those in favour, please say aye. <coughs> against abstentions carried. There's no public forum. Chairperson's report will be a verbal report at the end of open. We'll address that in the changes to order of business. <coughs> I have in front of me no late items. So nothing requiring acceptance confidential business to be transferred into the open. Councillor Rick Kurak. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, DC 239, that's regarding the Bella Vista prosecution costs. Now, I looked through the report and the reason given was um, legal professional privilege and negotiation, etc. But I couldn't find any reference to legal entities and the details of the case or whatever, and it was purely around the funding. So if I could have some reconsideration of whether that's required to be in the public, and I don't expect an answer now, but by the end of the meeting, like the report was actually written by Fraser Smith, <coughs> uh, the, he's a finance guy. So I, I struggle with the rationale. There was some discussion of this topic in the agenda briefing session, Council. Um, staff gave reasons then. I accepted their reasons, but conscious of the fact that it could be addressed in a public forum. So happy to hand the response to staff. Through the Chair, there were a number of, of reasons, um, in, including giving the ability of elected members to actually um, have a, a broader conversation around the matter at hand, which obviously is confidential and, and sensitive matter um, and also just um, you know, the, the, the quantum of, of that at this point in time we wouldn't advise to put into, into public. So the correct. Uh, following the response from Paul, regarding the ability to have a broader discussion, uh, couldn't that be had by moving into confidential um, uh, for that discussion? What we would suggest would be is that leaving the item in confidential and then following that conversation, we could at that point bring that out into open. The benefit of that too is we can perhaps share a little bit more about our reasoning in the close for retaining it in close that we can't really do it in a public forum. And then if you still wish to move it into open at that point, you could. Are you comfortable with that, Councillor? I'm happy to take a motion. Just looking around, I don't think there's probably a lot of support from elected members, so, oh, I don't know, I'll test it, I'll test it, yeah, uh, so I do move that it goes into open. Do we have a seconder? Second that. I, can I just give a little bit of advice? Um, if you do do that and it's unsuccessful, then you can't bring that same motion back later on in the meeting, you're going to need to get 75% in favour. So uh. our suggestion to you was that you have it in close so the staff can give you a little bit further advice. If you still want to do it and uh, move it into open, you can put that motion at that time. But if you were to put, put it now and it was not to succeed, it would be a higher benchmark for it to succeed at the end of the meeting. So that would just be a bit of advice for you to take into account. Um, sorry, so has it been seconded or not? I have a seconder, Councillor Catherine Stewart. Um, so I can withdraw. Yes. And given the advice um, and looking around the table, I, I will do that. Thank you, Mr. 
Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other items of confidential? Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. And firstly, may I ask people using the microphones to bring them close and speak clearly and loudly. I tried to listen to the uh, YouTube and it was nearly impossible to hear for those people that wish to listen. So, um, thank you, Mr Chair. Page 77, document 19156. Can that come out in the open once it's uh, been ratified as per what's in our agenda? That's the decision, Council, that can be made at the point of discussion or post-discussion, right. so uh, you're I'll foreshadowing a motion for later. I will raise it then during the confidential section. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other items councillors would like to see moved in the open at this stage? There being none, we move to the next item of the agenda, which is changes to the order of business. Um, we've had a request from the Mana Whenua Partnership that their report, DC245, be moved to the afternoon, one o'clock, and I'm happy to do that, and I've also given an indication that um, I will be presenting a verbal chairperson's report at the end of open business today. Um, given it's the last meeting. Councillor Leanne Brown. Um, Mr Chair, would it be worth considering doing the Main Street monitoring reports early given we have the Main Street members sitting behind me and Bella Vista moving, or do we have someone here speaking with the Bella Vista or to Bella Vista report? Um, we, we do need to do Bella Vista first because we have a requirement for that staff member to leave promptly. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Steve Morris. Um, yeah, just a point of order in terms of changing the order of business. Um, I seek advice from the chair. Is the chair able to change the order of business without the approval of the committee? No, and I would seek that once we've got on board all the changes that are proposed. Oh, that, that's my ruling. Uh, if I may then, given you're asking us to approve your chairperson's report being moved, can you give any reason why you wish it to be at the very end rather than at the beginning? Yeah, because I think what I've planned is a summation of it's the last meeting of the triennium. I've never presented a chairperson's report before, and I'd like to sum up following the end of business, and uh, that's the main reason. So, as I said, my view is I should seek the approval of the committee for the changes to the order of business. The changes to the order of business we have is moving the Mana Whenua Partnership Monitoring Report DC245, I'll take them separately, um, to one o'clock this afternoon. I'll move that from the chair. Do I have a seconder? Seconded Mayor G Gregory Brownless. I don't intend to speak to it. The seconder wish to speak to it. Anyone else wish to speak? In which case, I'll move the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against. Abstentions. Carried. And I'd like to move from the chair, for obvious reasons, that the chairperson's report be moved to the last item of open today. I have a seconder in Councillor Kelvin Clout. Don't think I need to speak to the motion. I've already done so in response to a question from councillors. With a seconder wish to speak? Does anyone else wish to speak to the motion on the table? In which case, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, abstentions, carried. We now move to confirmation of minutes. Matters arising, adoptions of recommendations. Are there any amendments to the minutes, please? Okay. If there are no amendments, we have a motion in front of us, recommendation confirming the minutes. Do I have a mover for the motion in the agenda? Moved Councillor Kelvin Clout, seconded Councillor Leanne Brown, speaking to the motion, Councillor. Seconded. Anyone wish to speak to the motion? In which case I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against. Abstentions. Carried. Just a small point of order. Mr Chairman, if I may, just at some point if the committee staff could give us advice 
on what seems to become the practice with your committee that we start having speaking to minutes or speaking to procedural motions, whether that is in fact a possibility or not. I, I would have thought we don't normally speak, we have matters arising to minutes, but we don't normally speak to them as a debating issue, but if it could be clarified at some point later. That would it currently it sits as a chairperson's ruling, but I'd be happy to take a challenge. Um, moving on to the next item in the agenda, declarations of conflicts of interest. Uh, Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. In confidential, page 70, case 11. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Max Mason. Uh, DC 168. Thank you. Uh, any other conflicts of interest? Uh, those have been recorded, I believe. We now move to the first item of business on the agenda for today. That's DC 204, the Bella Vista update. We have a staff member to speak to this report. Over to you, Howard. Um, <clears throat> good morning. I'll try to speak clearly. Um, just, I'll, I'll take the report as read, um, and I'll just highlight three um, updates since the time of writing. Um, so paragraph three, um, another house left site um, on Monday and preparations underway for a yet another house to be removed probably on the weekend. So um, we've got 11 out of 16 have left the site now and hopefully it will be 12 by um, early next week. Um, paragraph 14, um, that um, a draft has been received of that advice about um, what the lots will look like that we intend to um, release to the market on Lakes Boulevard <coughs> and staff are ru working through that draft at the moment. And the other point is that um, I'm well supported by uh, finance and business staff um, who can answer any questions about the finances, which I probably cannot. Um, and I believe that does, to a large extent, mirror what you see in the um, draft annual report as well. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Councillor Steve Morris. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Just wondering in terms of paragraph 12, <coughs> whether you're able to go into any further detail in this forum around <coughs> these further defects being found with the dwellings in Anita Way? Um, I, I don't have um, strong technical knowledge of it, but I am aware that some of the weatherboarding was not um, installed as per manufacturer's recommendations. Um, that seemed to be the, the major issue that was uncovered. Councillor Leanne Brown. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Howard, the draft strategy that you were just talking about, will that be coming back to this council um, in this term? At this stage, it was intended for um, senior executive sign off um, rather than elected member sign off. Um, that's my understanding at the moment. Councillor Larry Baldock. Thank you, Howard. Just in paragraph. Um, Eight, uh, about the sediment and control plans. Um, a consent application accompanies, accompanies this. A further two-month delay is forecast. Can you just clarify that that's, is that a delay because of getting that consent or is it what was happening from other activities there? It just seems strange. We're trying to protect the environment and yet there's sort of a delay in winter because we're trying to get the consent to protect the environment. Uh, no, it's, a <coughs> it's a good question. Um, through the chair, the, consent, the consenting authority is Bay Plenty Regional Council. We're working extremely cooper cooperatively with them. Um, we, so we have um, lodged the consent applications, but in fact, two more, the, the house that left on Monday and the house that hopefully leaves on the weekend, have to leave to enable us to have space to build um, some bunding and another sediment pond. So it's a little, it's quite a tight site and it's quite sloping. So it's interrelated and um, we're, 
working cooperatively each step of the way as the site unfolds itself. So that, so that bunding will protect it further while we go ahead with the rest of the you know, retaining and all the rest of it? Yes, that's correct. Mayor Gregory Brownless. Thanks. Just in relation to the MB determination on 311 and 307 Lakes Boulevard, uh, not received yet, but is there any indication when we might have an answer on those? If they um, I, I really don't have any information about that. Uh, we can try to get back to you with um, dates for um, expected determinations. Councillors, are there any further questions? with regard to report DC 204, in which case I've got moved Councillor Larry Baldock, seconded, have a motion in the agenda, seconded Councillor Steve Morris, speaking to the motion Councillor, seconder, any further speakers to the motion, in which case I'll put the motion, all those in favour please say aye, aye. against, abstentions, carried. We now move to DC 168, Main Street Monitoring Report. Morning, Michael. Morning, Bring your hands. Um, uh, just move to have the, well, receive the report for Main Street. Is read. I have um, uh, the Main Streets, Mount Main Street, and Downtown Main Street here to talk to their reports. Good morning, Grant Aislab is my name. I'm the chairman of the Mount Main Street, soon to be renamed Mount Monganui Business Association. What the board has found is there is a lethargy in amongst the business community about being involved with Main Street. It's stale, it's old, it does the same things every week. So a change of name is going to be a good thing. Um, it's not an original thought, I stole it from the Newmarket Business Association, having worked up there for five or six years. They were very helpful in helping me get a new constitution together. We've also taken the uh, step of rebranding, and I should have thought that we've got a whole heap of stickers which have got Love the Mount on them. Um, we will get over next week and get them on all your cars in the car park so you won't have missed out. Um, apart from that, we're happy with the Porotakataka Park. It's locally renamed as Melanoma Park because there's absolutely no shade from the sun, but we're told that that's going to change. We're grateful to think that people will be able to find the shops and also that Mountie will be reinstalled without a guerrilla process taking place. Um, it's been difficult to hold the board back from getting a large truck with a high ab and just depositing Mountie on a suitable corner and on an entrance to the mount, so we'll wait and see what you folks suggest. We're in good heart, both membership-wise and financially. It's an exciting year that we're working into. Uh, we've been helped immeasurably by your council representatives and your councillors, and long may it continue. Happy to answer any questions. Councillor Leanne Brown. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Grant. Um, <coughs> lots of questions, <coughs> but I'll restrict them. As you know, yesterday we saw you on site. Um, we had site visit to Te Papa Onamono Porotakataka, <clears throat> and councillors went through physically looking at the site and we went through the goods, bads and quite a few uglies. Um, so just for your information, what we are going to do is um, collate, collate a list of what the easy gains would be. What are the quick wins that we can do to make it better in, in terms of colour and, and the aesthetics of the park and the functionality of it? But um, as also part of that, we'll look at the toilet block because that's going to be a much bigger, longer term discussion. In terms of Mountie, well, I think from speaking from yesterday's visit, we're all keen to see it back in the park. 
So what's Main Street's um, position on the ownership of Mounty? I think it's, at the moment it's insured for something like $35,000. It has high value. Um, what's your position? Are you happy to vest it to us, rent it, lease it, own it, give it? What's your view on that? Because that's unknown at this stage. Councillor, we haven't considered that yet, but if you're picking up the bill for the insurance, it's possible we would vest it in the council. Um, a lot of it, I think, depends on where it's put. Once, once a suitable place is, is found, I, I'm sure the board will say, well, that's, that's fair. Um, it's, a, it's an asset of the city and it should vest in the city. But that's only me speaking. Supplementary. So yeah, owned by Mount Main Street, insured by Mount Main Street at this point in time. And I'm detecting that as providing it was located suitably within the park, because we see it as a draw card. It's iconic. It's everyone's love. And uh, probably the most photographed uh, asset of of uh, the area, so um, we can have that discussion with you. Sorry, Councillor Kelvin Clough. Uh, thanks very much, Grant, for coming along, and thanks for your enthusiasm for um, everything the Mount and for the changes that you're looking to institute. Um, I noticed that the last two financial years we're still waiting for audited accounts. Can you just give us an update on that, please? Because it's quite important for us. The auditor is being hammered by our uh, secretary treasurer person, uh, and who came to see me yesterday and apologised profusely for not having engendered the audited report. I understand it is on its way and it shouldn't be too far away. Um, ironically, one of the things that was holding it up was they didn't have a photograph of the Christmas decorations. Clearly in our community there is a concern that people are stealing Christmas decorations from public funds and we've got to stamp this out, so we'll get those photos. Councillor Larry Baldock. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Just supplementary to um, Councillor Brown's comments about insurance, can I ask the appropriate executive uh, leadership team member, I can't imagine that that would add anything to our insurance bill if that was vested to us, it would be absorbed into our normal schedule. Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you, through the Chair to Grant. Good morning, Grant. Uh, with regards to shading, uh, what is the view of members, what would be appropriate for that area? No idea, to tell you the truth. Um, it is a work in progress. We're waiting for the larger trees to push up a bit, giving a growing season. We, we struggle to see how it all fits together at the moment, because it is new. And uh, I suspect that later on, when we see how it is used, who's using it, what the complaints are to us, we may be able to come back and be a bit more positive about how we might solve that problem. But what I don't want to see is I don't want to see some well-intentioned person rush in and put shade sails all over the place and, and create more problems than they solve. I mean, I'd much rather have a little man standing there handing out umbrellas than to do that in the short term. Councillor Leanne Brown. Apologies, Mr Chair, just two more questions. Um, the lamp posts refresh. Um, I met with Ingrid prior to her leaving and with a staff member and walked the street, did a bit of a stop take, I guess, and a check of condition. And at that time, she was concerned about the state of the seating, which um, is an expensive project to replace those, and also of the rubbish bins. So do you, the current board, have a view of that whole, the, the whole aesthetics of the street, rather than just the lamp posts? Yes, I, um, it, it does seem a shame that uh, years ago we did a total refurbish of downtown the Mount under the Phoenix project. We have now done the Porotakataka Park. Everything's looking quite good, but it's radiating inwards out, and so the approaches to the township itself aren't particularly flash. The committee's view is that we should be looking at hardy plants in the, in the planting bays rather than ripping out plants every three or six months and, and uh, fouling the air with the smell of fertiliser. Uh, it's less maintenance. Some idiot said that if we put coastal type plants there, it'll track rubbish. Well, that's easy fix. We pick it up and put it in a rubbish tin. So uh, that one doesn't carry any weight with the board. Uh, the, the street light posts are in bad repair, and sooner or later something's going to have to, have to be done. It's not a huge priority for us at the moment. But it would be nice to think that it's on a, a cyclical repair process, because we don't want that situation where they have to be done immediately, which puts a premium on the price of repair, because one of them's fallen over and hit some old deer on the head. So 
you know, it's up to you guys to look at your maintenance program and say, look, we know it has to be done. Let's schedule it out, sort of five, seven years, whatever. So we can follow up. We've already started the conversation with our, pa our places and spaces team around um, more coastal type planting, so I'll follow that up. And also regarding the signage on Pilot Bay, I do understand there is a yellow sign saying shopping centre on Prince. Has that been removed? Would you uh, no, want more? No idea. I don't go down there. Um, I, I don't know if it's there or not. Neither does my manager. So uh, it's not a, not a biggie at the moment. It's nice to know that someone's looking at the, the signage issue. And, and, and just saying that the lamppost won't hold it or no one else has got it to me does not seem a sensible solution to a, to a, a public problem of the people who live in the place. Do we have any further questions of Grant? In which case, thank you, Grant. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. We have enough chairs, Michael. <laughs> morning, Brian. Morning, Sally. Um, we are now talking, I assume, about downtown. Please, the floor is yours. Correct. Thanks, uh, Mr Chair and elected members for uh, listening to uh, us and me yet again. Um, last night, we're not just thinking about this. I was thinking, uh, why me? Why am I uh, on a number of levels, and so was my wife, why you? But anyway, uh, why me? Why am I doing this? Uh, you know, which is often a thankless task and a voluntary task. And, you know, with consideration, um, I'm born and raised in Tauranga, and I want to see uh, Tauranga actually fulfil its potential. And I like to think that we're all here to do that, and, uh, and we're strongly advocating, um, you know, for our CBD has been part of the, the greater Tauranga uh, community and not been seen in isolation from the community. Anyway, thank you for receiving our six month, uh, monthly report to Council for the period January to June 2019. Uh, as usual, it's been a busy period for uh, Main Street Tauranga and I'll assume that you've all read the, the report in, in detail, so I would, won't go through it in uh, in line by line. I'd just like, whilst I come from the dark side of the harbour, I'd, I'd certainly like to uh, support Grant in actually having uh, Mountie um, put back up because uh, I couldn't believe that he was taken down in the first place. So I, I think he's a, sort of a pretty iconic uh, little statue in, in downtown the Mount. Anyway, I'd like to take a moment to talk about what is detailed, m more so at the end of the report. We continue, continue to proactively support our members through the development of the city centre. As evidence in these ch very chambers last week, the city centre is, is in ex extenuating circumstances and needing significantly more than business as usual in terms of support for our members. We at Main Street Tauranga are the city centre's biggest and most vocal champions. We are working harder than ever and increasing our call for support to you our council to get behind our business owners and operators and give them the support they need and deserve. As we have continued to highlight in, uh, to you, our city centre businesses are facing extreme challenges as we traverse through trans transformational growth and largely most of it is out of, out of our members' control. Our members do not sign up for this level of disruption um, and Access into and around the city remains a cr critical concern. Delayed projects add to the pressure. A lack of solid communication, support and empathy for our members is apparent and it needs to stop and to change. We continue to need a collaborative approach and we ask Tauranga City Council to be more dis demonstrative in your empathy and support for our changing city centre. Understanding the human face of our members' challenge of our members' challenges can go a long way to building a stronger community. And for those that came down to the Red Square um, a few days ago, um, th there was a, a big turnout from uh, from our retail members, and uh, and it brought a personal face to I think um, you know the issues that the CBD is facing at present, and uh, and uh, rather than just being anecdotal um, evidence. 
We ask you to stop saying we can't, no, and it is what it is, and instead say, how can we help? As Sally outlined very well in these chambers last week, we are asking for our members to be seen, heard, and responded to. We have a direct link to our members, so by ensuring Main Street Tauranga is kept abreast of all communications from TCC, we can work with you to spread the word more effectively on changes, updates, and important information in a timely manner. Our liaison with uh, Council was stronger six to nine months ago when Marty Grenfell uh, came on board as CEO, but it's lost traction since then uh, with the internal uncertainty within the Council offices. So what is t downtown Tauranga or Main Street Tauranga proactively doing uh, to support the city centre and our members? We will be back in chambers on the 27th, um, asking you to support us and join us in a program of care for our city centre. We will be seeking foundation support for our Activate Vacant Spaces initiative. We're also launching a major promotions and advertising campaign through our marketing program and in collaborative partnership with some of our media partners to profile, promote and support our members. This campaign will follow on from Taste Tauranga and run in the lead up to Christmas. In shaping up the campaign, our management and marketing team have developed a significant value-added partnership with media partners, which will see an unprecedented level of add-on support for our city centre, yet there's more we will be asking you to do. We will be asking Tauranga City Council to also join us to add your own weight to this promotional support campaign for our city centre and to respond in other ways. Our members need the support more than ever. I would finish by reverting back to our submitted six monthly report and ask if you have any questions that uh, you, you may like us to answer. Thank you. Any questions, councillors? Councillor Kelvin Clown. Thanks, Brian and Sally, for coming in this morning. Um, Brian, you mentioned that there was some uncertainty with our own internal staffing sort of connection with you. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more, please? Yeah, I, th I think there was uh, a lot of uncertainty uh, for uh, several months as to who was actually still going to be in the, um, the, the city centre transformation sort of package that the council had internally, and uh, I think that's only probably been resolved uh, in perhaps the last couple of months. Uh, we are, well, I think we're still frustrated a bit, yeah, um, by, um, by um, a, a lower level of, of liaison than we had six to nine months ago. Do you agree, Sally? Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you, through the Chair. Um, Brian, I'm pleased to see that you're working in collaboration with staff regarding the Christmas decorations. So is that all progressing well? Um, it continues to work well. We actively, from the beginning of each year, um, work with TCC to try and um, encourage a really proactive approach to Christmas because Christmas tends to be somewhat lacking in the city centre. So um, our push to support our members is to work with TCC and encourage as much emphasis on that as possible. So we have given a budget for that. So yeah, look forward to seeing how it all turns out. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Larry Baldock. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, thank you, Brian, for your report. Um, congrats to... to um, I guess Sally for the launch of Taste Tauranga the other day too, which was very successful, well attended. Um, you're coming back to us on the 27th. I understand you're having a meeting with Main Street members. Is it before that? 15th. Uh, this, th this Thursday. Yeah. This Thursday. Yes. So it would be. We were having discussions yesterday. We we do frequently <laughs> talk about you know what we can practically do. So. Could we squeeze a meeting in between the 15th and the 27th after you've had your meeting with your members where we can hear really solidly from the membership what they really want us to do? I, I, don't, think, I don't really think there's a lack of empathy here. It's just finding what things will actually work. We'd absolutely welcome that meeting and move calendars to make it happen for our members. And no, can no. I just technically say, thanking me for Taste Tauranga is probably um, unfair in that um, Millie does a huge amount of work for Taste Tauranga, so please <laughs> understand that it's Millie and Fiona and the rest of the team, and I'm just part of it. Sorry. Just can I just add, I, I, I think um, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that we've got some of our um, 
long-term retailer members uh, now on board with uh, with Main Street Tauranga and the initiatives we're, we're, we've um, been undertaking. Um, there has been a conflict in the past with uh, with some of the long-termers, not understanding what was actually going on in the background and the, and the actual depth of what was being done to both advocate for and to promote the CBD. So I think we've, we've sort of... Um, uh, reached a bit of a watershed moment, uh, and we've got a great opportunity to move on with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, retailers that have been here for sort of 30 years, um, and some of them, and who, um, like me, want to see the area uh, fulfil its potential. Look, thank you, Brian, for that. The conflict within Main Street, I think, has been evident for a few years in terms of particularly the mixed messages that various elected members have received over that time. So appreciate the acknowledgement of that and the recognition and, and, and the hope, obviously, that, that that message is more coherent going forward. Councillor Terry Malloy. Yeah, just um, first of all, thank you, um, um, Shelley and Brian and Millie, for the, for the good work that you guys have done over the last few years, especially in, in under very, very difficult circumstances. Um, you know, there, there's no easy answers out there. And I, you know, I personally believe that... Um, the CBD needs more support from council, you know, while we go through this transition. As you rightly pointed out, um, none of the businesses in the CBD signed up for this disruption, which uh, is likely to go on for five years. So, uh, um, and, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, I, I do report back to council on, on uh, the concerns that the businesses have there, but some of the councillors, I think, believe I'm dreaming when I talk about the, the, the problems and the heartache that many of the, uh, of the businesses are going through. So I'd, I'd really look forward to that meeting, if you could arrange it with the businesses, with the councillors. Um, hopefully we'll get, some, we'll get some reality there. I've got one other question for you, though, Sally. Um, can you clarify if the funding model has changed since Tuscany took on the full management and marketing contract for Main Street, please. Uh, happy to respond to that. No, it has not. When Tuscany um, pitched for the marketing and management of the Main Street Tauranga contract, we did it on the basis that we would not charge any more than was the funding model back then for the administration, management and marketing of downtown Tauranga. That has not changed. We have not increased that in the time and tenure that we've had the contract. And in fact, we've delivered savings. One example would be when we first took over the contract, the board back then had just signed a sublease on new offices in the Tourism Bay of Plenty premises. We recommended to the board that that was a waste of money and that we could save the money with their approval. We subleased the offices, um, and that saved them per year $4,800, which over the course of our tenure has saved Main Street $19,200, which has been returned to the marketing fund. In addition to that, I could go on about the level of value added that Tuscany puts on the table for Main Street every day. The cost opportunity is huge. We do it as an investment in our city, and I hope that answers some of your questions. Thank you very much, Sally. Appreciate that. Councillor Bill Granger. Hey, thanks, Brian and Sally. And uh, I see the Xmas parade. Um, you've extended it um, uh, to, to fill the weekend, which I think is a brilliant idea. <laughs> Um, how's, how's that running? And I, I see that five grand application to TCC events was turned down, um, but you have a, a sponsor, I think it's Trust Power, uh, uh, help me a sponsor. Have you got any more sponsors on board as well, or lucky to have? Um, and, and the general planning, and, and that's going okay as regards to the stage show on the waterfront? In, um, other, in other words, how's it running? <laughs> It's very much a team approach. Millie and Fiona lead the charge on the Christmas parade. Yes, our $5,000 funding was turned down. Um, so we do walk around um, with a bit of a begging bowl, trying to find the necessary funds to expand out the Christmas parade every year. It's a massive challenge. It's a massive event. The Christmas parade was technically an event that we took over with Tauranga City Council and were asked to do so some years ago. We had a meeting in the Tourism Bay of Plenty offices, actually, when it was agreed that we would help Tauranga City Council run the Christmas Parade. Somehow it ended up in our basket um, with very little help from Tauranga City Council, so um, every year it is an absolute challenge 
to run what is a showcase event that brings in over, I think at last count, 25,000 people into the city with massive health and safety requirements and logistics to run. So um, it's no easy task. We are always short on money, and this year I think we are still needing money. We don't actually have the money to run the full weekend of events at the moment. Well, I do hope it goes well, and if there's any assistance that the council can give you, I think that's a plus. Uh, I often get asked, you know, what is happening this Christmas uh, and, and the Christmas parade. I think it was cancelled last year because of the, the weather, etc. And uh, I think people are looking forward to something that's going to spark off this year. So I do hope it runs well. Ideally, we'd love it to return to the partnership model that it should be. It shouldn't sit on Main Street Tauranga's funding crisis. Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. Through the Chair to Brian. Um, earlier you mentioned about uh, access around the city being problematic. Um, what can Council do to improve that? Um, the, the, I think the, the main thing for a start is to communicate uh, what is actually uh, where the issues are and, and what is available. Uh, you know, I think a year ago I said uh, we should have um, electronic sign, sign boards at the entry points to town saying that there's X car parks available for the public in the um, Spring Street car park, Elizabeth Street car parks and so on. So it's all about communication really. Um, and you know, we're, um, we're starting to you know, perhaps um, partner better with the media as well around that and then trying to send a message out there um, now that we do have you know, some of our, um, you know, our longer two members on, on side, um, we can actually you know, change the tone of, of media and uh, actually tell the community uh, why they should come into town. And you know, we, know, we recognise that there are issues, but also to actually get a, a, across the point that it's, uh, the perception is worse than the reality. Councillor yeah. Steve Morris. Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, just picking up on the statement about funding, is downtown Tauranga um, likely to request an increase in the um, targeted rate for businesses in downtown Tauranga to, um, to deal with that? I think uh, in our submission to the long term plan, we. Uh, we had an increase of was it three percent? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's what it was. So you know, we've we've really just uh, I think we're behind inflation for the last few years. In fact, so um, uh, yeah. So at this stage, um, yeah, it was in the long term plan. We haven't sort of uh, addressed that for the future yet. Any further questions of Brian or Sally? Interest. Thank you. Any further comments at all, Michael? In which case, None at all things. In which case, colleagues, we have a recommendation in your agenda. Do I have a mover? Moved, Councillor Leanne Brown. Seconded, Councillor Terry Malloy. Speaking to the motion, Councillor. Just very briefly acknowledging the tough job that all of these main streets have. Um, the hard. Um, yards that they do, the real inability at times to measure their success. It's one of those jobs and a lot of marketing. You know, if it's sales, you can record it, but when it's anecdotal it, and a lot of what they do is about perception. So it's, yeah, it's, a, tough, it's a tough gig and um, they've got some really good boards, good strategic plans, their finances are in good shape and um, they need all the support they can get from this council going forward into the next triennium. Second to wish to speak. Uh, yeah, just briefly, I've uh, been involved with Main Streets now, I think, for uh, over 20 years. And uh, I believe the current Main Streets, Taronga, um, the Mount, and, and Greerton, are probably in as uh, uh, good a space as I've ever been. And I think they do a, a great job. And uh, the, I believe the retailers and the businesses, if anything ever happened to Main Street, would be very quickly calling for another organisation to look after them. So uh, we need to. Um, we need to support them and and, uh, and uh, make sure they can continue to do the work they are. Thank you. Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. Um, with regards to the Mountie and other things, the shading cloth at the Mount, I wondered through the chair to Michael, 
um, whether there's an opportunity for city partners to help facilitate something in that regard. And um, with uh, Brian's comments before, um, I feel frustrated for him because I have also raised that issue about having signs at each end of the CBD. So are we spending our money in a proactive way or is it just, I don't know, going internally into a, a void or, or whatever? So um, I just ask that staff please listen to the comments that Brian and Sally and all the Main Streets amount um, are making as well and just see what we can do. They're only, I believe, little things, but they they make a big impression. So, yeah, if we can please be proactive. Any further speakers to the motion? I make a comment that much of the challenge I think downtown Main Street particularly faces is because that our CBD is different to the other areas. It has the bit above the retail, which makes things a much bigger challenge, and I think we should recognise that. Um, I think that while I appreciate that the members of downtown didn't sign up for what they've got, particularly in terms of disruption in the CBD, um, Main Street over the years has been an enthusiastic supporter of much of the transformational, and I'll put that in inverted commas, work that certain people have advocated for very strongly. And one would have to say, based on the headlines of the last triennium, that perhaps Council, in its enthusiasm by majority to transform the city, has forgotten to manage it as well as it might have and that has imposed significant collateral damage on the retailers in downtown. Um, the parking issue is perennial, but of course that is a function to a certain extent of the fact that the retail customers are competing with the customers of the first floor and second floor and third floor and the employees of the first floor and second floor and third floor and the owners of the first floor and second floor and third floor, as well as probably all the consultants that are coming to visit Tauranga City Council. It is a tough burden you bear, and I think we should recognise that, and it, it does need to be thought through, and perhaps Council needs to do less better and give downtown a chance of succeeding. So I appreciate the work you do. <coughs> Any further speakers to the motion? In which case, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Abstentions? Abstention of Councillor Max Mason? <coughs> Carried. We'll now move to the next item on the agenda. Obviously, DC 245, we postponed, we've changed the order of business to one o'clock. The next item, I believe, is tsunami sirens, DC 243, page 95. Julian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, through the Chair. Uh, council will recall that this matter was brought uh, from the Council meeting and it was specifically referring to Stage 2 of the SIREN project. Stage 1 is accommodated uh, already in budgets and this was a paper to outline the implications of that budget and going forward where the funds uh, could be drawn upon in terms of uh, the deferral and hold of fees specifically. I, I, we can take the report as read. Um, any financial qu questions, Susan can specifically answer other questions uh, and I'll be able to handle. Thank you. Councillors, any questions of the report? Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. Um, as this process progresses, I um, I know it will be reported back to projects and monitoring, but I just wonder if there could be some elected member, I don't know, not a working party, but just a, just I'm just concerned that <laughs> it might head off in the wrong direction if um, just uh, yeah, based on some other projects. Um, so I'm just highlighting. 
that elected members be fully informed and maybe an opportunity for when the new council's in place, there might be, I don't know, someone or uh, who can just liaise with you so everyone's fully informed on it, um, other than getting the reports every you know few months or whatever. So it's just, yeah, that opportunity there for the next council to be more involved in it. And through the chair, I, I don't see that as a problem. I, right now, we're, cons uh, we're looking at that project team and the planning implications, being fully informed around this is imperative for this council. Any further questions? Councillor Leanne Brown. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm just looking to see <clears throat> if I missed it in the report, but I, what, at what point are we going to prepare a community engagement plan and a communication plan because this council has invested weeks, years and months in the evacuation routes and the signage and the maps and the planning and getting the community to understand their role in this as well as our role. So my biggest concern is the messaging and people understanding exactly what these sirens are going to deliver for our community in terms of warning and what they should be doing. So when is the communication plan and the, and the engagement plan and how we connect with our community, when's that going to come together? Uh, again, through the chair. Right now, um, we've, we're pulling together the, the overall overview of the project plan. Uh, two really key elements out of that will be council fully understanding its uh, planning aspects and uh, getting our ducks in a row, if you, if, if for want of a better term, of where these things are optimally uh, placed, but you are absolutely right, the communication plan is key as we go forward because it is about um, what the expectation is out of sirens, the limitations of sirens, what the community is expect. So right up front, um, as part of that overall project plan, the comms plan is absolutely vital. So over the next few months, we are now pulling together that whole project plan. Comms is right up front in that. Councillor Steve Morris. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see in the paper installation is forecast for June 21. Um, when would you anticipate Council would go out for tender for the actual units? And um, how long have you set aside for um, fair consenting wins? In, in very general terms, without a really detailed project plan, it is really clear that an optimal process for planning is at least six months. So six to eight months. It's a bit of a circular process because then it's about risk to make sure that you can achieve the uh, consents that you require collectively because it is a network that we're trying to achieve. Therefore, the risks surrounding procurement would then follow. But when I say it's a circular process, there is procurement matters that would be have to be attended to while you're seeking a planning framework so you have sufficient information to go into the planning resource consent. But it would be at the completion of that that you would be able to then procure sirens. Now, uh, we do have some guidelines. Tamaru uh, uh, currently have undertaken that process, and it does take from, con um, from the moment you procure uh, through a supplier, it takes up to 8 to 12 months for ultimate construction supply delivery in the store. So that's why we've done a two-year time frame um, and we will learn out of Timaru what you can bring forward, what you can't. But the planning process will be um, uh, the first off the blocks. Any further questions of the report? In which case, thank you. We have a recommendation in the agenda. Do I have a mover? Moved Councillor Steve Morris. Seconded Councillor Leanne Brown. Yeah, our two ward councillors. Um, speaking to the motion, Councillor Morris. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, no, I just want to um, give my appreciation to staff um, 
in uh, reflecting the the will of the elected council in terms of um, this paper and the journey that we've been going on for the last few years in terms of uh, procuring some sirens for our coastal communities. I know that um, <coughs> particularly in the past um, the, the council has sort of pushed on uh, against staff advice um, but at the end of the day the customer is always right and if the, uh, the elected council is the, is the customer um, we, we're getting there in the end and I certainly appreciate um, the work that the current team are doing to, to really just get this done. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my um, colleague Councillor Brown who has been um, a tireless champion and, um, and great help in terms of getting this over the line and uh, also want to acknowledge um, the, the vote uh, at the previous, uh, I think it was a council meeting wasn't it? Was it a VSOC meeting or council meeting? Um, in, which in, in which colleagues um, voted um, unanimously to endorse the proposal and, and to come to here to this committee. And uh, again, in the past, that, that probably wouldn't have happened to that level. So thanks to colleagues, thanks to staff. Councillor Brown. Thank you. Um, I agree with Councillor Stewart around those continual check-ins. It's going to be really important this, that this project continually comes back to this council and if there are any red flags that they get raised. Um, and thank you, Julian, for that comfort around having a good communications plan. It's going to be really, really important that we do make it clear to the community what this system, this alerting system, is going to deliver for them, what their expectations are and those limitations. So communications going to be absolutely critical. Um, and thank you, Councillor Morris, for bringing stage two into this. Without, without that, this, we would only still be looking at stage one. But also thank you to this council for approving the tsunami um, sirens and giving our, com our community some comfort and um, another tool in that toolbox for um, uh, evacuations and alerting our community. Councillor Terry Malloy. I, you know, I think it's, um, it's a job well done. Um, congratulations to Councillor Morris and Councillor Brown. But I would like to uh, mention somebody else at this stage, somebody who's been banging on about World War II sirens at the Mount for um, probably 10, 12 years. And uh, to some extent, it's, it's, it's that incessant noise in the background for that period of time that's helped drive this. So um, well done, Councillor Granger. Mayor Gregory Brownless. Yes, that's right. That, it was a sort of more like an incessant whine, I think. But um, <laughs> I do remember years ago, and I remember going over to uh, Bay Park and listening to a, a siren test with a World War II one. Uh, and uh, of course, many people then rang up and said they couldn't hear it. But, uh, and then it sort of was taken on board by uh, Councillor Morrison Brown as well. Look, um, it's a warning system, and it's one of a number of things that would warn people. Um, I'm probably one of the few people that had really first-hand experience mm. of a tsunami afterwards, and I couldn't help but notice when I went to the coast of Thailand that the difference between life and death was 300 metres. Mm. And who, with an hour's warning, could have not got 300 metres? So it's going to be a bit further in the case of you know, our coastal areas in some cases, but that's that principle. If you have a warning, you have a chance to do something about it. And uh, if, uh, of course, the event's far enough away, you may well have a lot longer uh, than that. So it's just one of a number of methods, and the other, you've got the, the text alerting, you've got phones. Uh, all of those have holes in them, and there's always going to be someone who doesn't hear it, whether it's a siren or a text because they've turned their phone off and the other thing hasn't worked. So the number one thing is you've got to ch check your neighbours, you know, because one of you is going to have heard one method or another. So that is the number one thing. And if people do that, well, I'm, I'm confident that we will have an excellent um, system. I just can't help uh, but comment that it isn't ridiculous that planning consents could in any way inhibit <laughs> these sirens being put in place. But I've heard that it's happened. I've heard in the case of some volunteer fire brigades around the country, or oh, they can't get permission. You know, I mean, really, do you have to have a... <laughs> In the event of blowing a siren, it isn't going to be just for fun. It's because someone's life at risk, and yet uh, they're not going to be used willy-nilly. 
and yet we've got to go through this nonsense. I, th I just wonder what state we've allowed to get our uh, resource management considerations into. Thank you. Councillor Larry Baldock. I think it first needs to be made clear that any comparisons between World War II sirens and Councillor Granger are purely coincidental. Um, but we do thank councillors that have been consistently working on this project for many, many years. Some of us were here and then went and came back again. Um, and it's good to see it get to this point and with, I think, the right kind of alerting systems and combination of systems still allows for other things to be added into the suite as well as people choose to take care of their own, um, you know, own personal concerns about how they get alerted. But um, I, I have to say we're not forgetting about um, those who live in the coastal margins of Tauranga City. Uh, you know, we tend to think and used to think that, you know, Marakana Island would protect us from a tsunami and so on, but we know from the modelling that in fact that's not the case. In fact, it in some ways can exacerbate it because as water comes over, it creates more of a tsunami in the harbour and so on. So we will be rolling out uh, stage three. I'm a bit concerned that it's sort of delayed as far as the 10 year plan, uh, next 10 year plan 21, 31, but um, you know, there are reasons for that. But I just want to reassure those who live on the coastal margins around, obviously around Matur and, and, and this part of Otomoto and so on, that, um, that it, is, it is part of the, the whole package that we're wanting to work on uh, in the inner harbour up around Ohauiti, uh, not Ohauiti, um, Welcome Bay and uh, down here. These, these can be areas too that will need to be alerted, uh, particularly once we've completed the walkway from Memorial Park to the CBD. We want to make sure people know to get off that quickly if there is a tsunami coming. Councillor Bill Granger. I suppose I've got to throw my little tuppence in here today. Thanks, thank, thank you other councillors for your comments. Uh, yes, I, um, I probably was a wine in the past. Um, uh, perhaps, perhaps my age is showing me here, but um, it's great that we finally listen to the people. They told us what they required, and, and I do remember I was part of that uh, bit of a trial with regards to the, the old World War II type siren, and uh, the day was real windy, and we only had the one siren up there, so there was some people that didn't hear it, but I can always remember m my mum and dad, um, they were part of World War II in Britain, and by crikey, they talked many times about those sirens how they did work so it was a little hard for me to get past um, uh, in regards to the old ones um, uh, versus the new ones so I do hope these new electronic sirens uh, are, are capable and well above the, um, the old World War Type 2 sirens so let's hope uh, it all goes well. Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. It's been a long journey with regard to the siren discussion and debate over 12 years. Um, since I first started on council and I guess 20 years ago when approximately 20 years ago when I was in Hawaii and there was a tsunami threat and hearing those sirens and seeing everyone respond to them straight away convinced me how good they were and I was part of um, Councillor Granger's trial that day many years ago uh, listening out for the siren and as he said uh, the wind was so strong and where I was standing at Matua I could not hear the one siren but I certainly remember it very vividly um, doing that. And so it's good that we're finally at the end of the journey where we are putting them in. I concur with Mayor Brownless's comments on re resource management uh, constraints and costs for our community. I mean it's such an important Thing and it will only be utilised in emergencies, so why we have to go through all the loopholes and that, it's just crazy really. Um, so good communication on the way through with elected members and the community will be pivotal to the success of this project. Yes, speaking in favour of the motion in front of us, um, I'd just make one observation because I think most of everything has been said but with regards to staff 
staff have been in a difficult situation because central government has equivocated and undenied and changed direction and staff have been giving us advice based on what's been happening in Wellington and staff are frequently in a situation where they advise us if you like what's happening at a national level and the guidance and um, are sometimes torn um, so I think we need to appreciate that I believe that the heart of the staff has always been in this place and they would have seen it as a priority and, and before we comment on staff I would observe that some have favoured other capital projects over this one elected members over the years I've always found that difficult to understand that being said as I say I support the motion in front of us any further speakers does the mover wish to speak in reply in which case I'll put the motion on the table all those in favor please say aye, aye. against abstentions and I'll note that is carried unanimously We now move to report DC 260, the annual residence report, or annual residence survey, sorry, 2019. Uh, Josh is not here today, so I'll be Deputy Josh. To my right is Ronell Morgan, who is a senior research executive at Key Research and is therefore responsible for the large piece of paper in front of you. I'm responsible for the smaller piece of paper, the covering report. Um, I'm going to take it as read and just accept questions as and when they come. Councillor Kelvin Clout. Thanks very much, uh, Jeremy and Ren Renee. Ronell, Ronell, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm just always interested when it comes to these surveys whether or not. Uh, people with mobile phones are included in that sort of data set because um, I couldn't see here if it was or not. So can you just explain that please? In terms of the sample for the survey, we purchased landline and mobile numbers. So it is a combination of both. Um, increasingly people are uh, selecting to not list either their landline or mobile and we have therefore put forward the motion that the next year survey take a new method, uh, being a mixed method approach for data collection. Um, sorry, that will involve um, sending out the invitation to participate in an online survey with a hard copy survey as a backup. Uh, we find this method quite successful with other councils. Younger audiences prefer to do the online survey. Working audiences prefer the online survey and all the residents prefer to write on a hard copy. Thank you. Councillor Larry Baldock. Just supplementary, just how many pages would that hard copy uh, be in that? Sorry, in terms of the size of that hard copy, we are restricted by New Zealand Post. Um, there's a total of 12, so that's six pages back to back at the most because we do want to send the back page as free post so you basically have 11 pages to get your questions on that does mean we have to review the questionnaire and make sure that only the essential questions are asked you wonder whether it it's a, you know you could do it through the rates notices as a way of distribution it would if we were serious about getting a really good response from the community it may well be something worth considering. Um, sorry, the, just to clarify, the sample is get, um, obtained from the electoral roll. So instead of only targeting ratepayers, it will include all residents that are registered to vote. So anybody 18 plus, whether they are a ratepayer or not, will therefore have an opportunity to participate. It is a random selection. We're not sending it to all the electorates in this area, um, but the random selection will be done by ward to ensure that we have a sample across each ward and we will ensure a sample selection from the general electoral roll as well as the Maori electoral roll to ensure representation. Councillor Rick Kurek. 
So looking at, at the report, um, you obviously identify whether the, um, the person is a ratepayer or not, because on page, I'm just looking at page 121, where it refers to ratepayers. But then in, in the comments below, it says comments from dissatisfied residents. So should, should that be dissatisfied ratepayers because it, it's in the context of um, value for money in terms of the rates that they pay? That's just a typo. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. That should be reading ratepayers, correct. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? So Max Mason. Um, Ronel, um, welcome to the council. Um, what, um, how, how do we perform in terms of, uh, is, I don't know if you can make a general statement, compared to other councils? How many other councils do you do and how, how do we perform with sort of good comparison? Uh, we use a similar model for 18 other councils. Two of them are regional councils, um, 10 of them are district councils, and we've got six city councils. In terms of how Tarana City Council performs, um, you're pretty much on average, if I take an average across those councils. Um, the one area where you're not performing as well as the other city councils is on water supply. However, you score 78%. And the average is 84. Councillor Larry Bordock. Yeah, just supplementary. I don't suppose there's anything in the data for you to assess whether that that drop is because of summer water restrictions in the last couple of years, or you know, I, I can't imagine anything else would would affect it. We water is at the tap, <laughs> you know. look at uh, page 156 of your agenda and it's got the, the flooding bit, so the section of drinking water is the next page. Um, the figures are pretty consistent over the years. Water conservation takes a little bit of a dip this year, oh sorry, it's in, yeah, a little bit of a dip, a 1% dip from last year. So the figures are pretty consistent over the years. Councillor Max Mason. Um, Ronell, um, with the matrix, sorry, on page where are we? Uh, 126. Your page, uh, 16. Sorry, 16, beg your pardon. Yep. What, what is leadership in the bottom quadrant, uh, left hand quadrant? What, is, what does that refer to? Can you give us some, what, what are the community looking for? from us, is it, it what, what different aspect of leadership? Thank you. The exact wording of that question was, um, could you rate Tauranga City Council for being committed to creating a great city, how it promotes economic development, being in touch with the community and setting clear direction? So overall, how would you rate council for its leadership? So it's not one specific role, it's a perception. Councillor Leanne Brown. Um, thank you. On page 65 of your report, 175 of ours, we're talking about sources of information about council. It's quite disappointing that people um, feel that it's gone down the ways that they can contact us, whereas I think we've become more accessible and more open in our ways we engage. Bottom of the page, report other, 29% of, of source information about council from other. Do you have any further information about what that other might be? Is there an additional question that's what, explaining what the other might uh, be? I think um, the 29% other was in 2017. So that has been back coded into the different groups. So in terms of that dot dropping down to only 1% rating other, um, I think we, we have been better at cleaning the data and making sure that the data quality is on par. Um, and we've definitely introduced codes, for example, internet and Google, 
in 2018 to pick up on that other from 2017, as well as council flyers, pamphlets, leaflets, and mailouts. Yes, supplementary, the concern is if we've gone, we have a huge decrease in other, but yet still overall, people still feel they can contact us less. So, um, so if you look at those two categories that Renelle just read out, they have no figure for 2017. So the, in the middle of your page, Council Flyers is 14% last year, 16% this year. And Internet Google was 8 last year, 15 this year. That's about your 30%, which comes off from 2017. So it's, it's, it's that recoding effectively. Um, you can also add word of mouth, being the other code that was introduced in 2018. Councillor Rick Kurek. Uh, Renelle, just further to the newspaper, um, the, the two main ones in Tauranga here, Bay Plenty Times and the Weekend Sun. Weekend Sun, you also refer to the online version, Sun Live, so it differentiates, but you don't in terms of the Bay Plenty Times, you know, the print version ver versus the website version? Yes. Oh, sorry, where is that? Yes, ah, <laughs> apologies. Any further questions? Councillor Steve Morris. Um, yeah, I, I see, I think it was a 10% of people get their information about council from the Bay News. I, I, th I think that ceased publication a couple of years ago. <laughs> Is it? The Bay News? Do you get it? Okay, well, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you, Sam. Um, Councillor Kelvin Cloud. Thank you. On page 140 of our report, one, uh, page 30 of yours, can you give any insight as to why there are more sceptics living in Te Papa and Welcome Bay? I just want to make sure that everybody understands the sceptic champions breakdown. This takes the four questions around reputation, which is how you do on leadership, um, faith and trust, financial management, and quality of services. So if you're skeptic, you are scoring low on all four of those measures. Um, if you're a champion, you score high on all four of those measures. Uh, Admira will score high on leadership faith and trust, the emotional stuff, but low on financial management and quality of services, whereas a pragmatist would be high on your practical things like financial management or quality of services, but they don't necessarily have the emotional connection. In terms of Welcome Bay and Te Papa, I'm going to refrain to comment, being a Welcome Bay resident, <laughs> I might be biased in my response. Councillor Max Mason. Um, one of the um, disappointing uh, results is um, on page uh, 64 of yours and 174 of ours, is the ability to contact. So lo last year that was rising nicely to 75% and it's dropped to 67. What, what would you put that down to? sort of questions we don't ask the follow-up questions the, the why questions necessarily so no this is just the data we'd have to look at amongst ourselves as to why that might be yes. well sorry that's one of those things that would potentially be good to have a follow-up from staff if we could if <laughs> other councillors are of a mind to do that just some sort of report back on that what's happening councillor larry bulldog thank you um just paragraph three of um, Jeremy's little piece of paper, um, and, but it does apply um, to, um, sorry I wrote your name down somewhere so I couldn't remember it, sorry. Renelle. <laughs> Renelle, thank you. Um, wh when you do the surveys split over three in three waves, 
it bothers me that you, the, you're then only dealing with 200 respondents at that particular time, and any one circumstance in the city that's just suddenly erupted can actually really n sort of negatively affect people at that time. I, I guess you have the same problem whether you do it once, you know, 600 or not, but, but um, I just, I, I'm really encouraged that you are looking at new methods for next year, new ways of broadening it, because I'm going to ask in a minute what the cost is on this, because we should, if we go to the trouble of doing it, we need to really make sure we use it <laughs> and, and change behaviour accordingly if necessary, if we're seeing something serious. But often we sort of, we don't because we're not sure it's real, it, you know, it is, it is really accurate in its reflection. And one of those reasons would be that it's split three ways or three times over the year. <coughs> You know, if Bella Vista had just erupted, for example, at the time you were surveying, we're going to get, a, a, you know, a very, a much more negative response, most likely. Can you comment? The first comment to make is that uh, the reason, one of the reasons, I can do that, one of the reasons um, to moving to the three uh, rather than the once a year, which we used to do, is precisely to take out that single big event which would skew the whole results. If we have a single event here now, at least it's weighted one third of the whole results. Um, as far as different methodology, I mean, Renal can talk about different methodology, but there is that balance between how much you want to invest um, and how accurate you want your results. Or Renal, maybe can you tell us how much we invested? If Joshua is here, he could tell you to the cent. Um, I can, but I can get it back to you quite quickly. Councillor Leanne Brown. Thank you. Back to the ability to contact, that really concerns me because um, I think we're very accessible um, as are the councillors. So a question to staff, and I don't know the process, but have we or can we explore an 0800 number option for our residents? Because I wonder if cost is a barrier. I've rung in a number of times and it's a long wait and some people have said oh, it's a concern for them with the cost of that, but can we explore an 0800 number for our residents to be able to contact us? Sorry, you might have to repeat that. I was distracted. Absolutely fine. Um, just talking about the ability to contact us and the concern that, that we are reduce, is reduced how people find they can contact us. Can we or have we explored the cost of having an 0800 number so residents can contact us at any time? What the cost would be? Uh, maybe it's an annual um, annual plan next year discussion. Uh, yes, it could be if there's not already one in existence. I oh, will find that out and let you know. Sorry, I don't know that. There are gen there are four noise complaints, but not just for the general ratepayer to be able to easily contact us at no cost to them. Um, may I have another question, Mr Chair? In terms, of course. Thank you. In terms of sources of information about council and probably topical of this past week's um, events around social media, and we have it in there, Tauranga City Council's Facebook page, but what about information that people are obtaining from other Facebook pages and other forms of social media that perhaps don't have the um, factual information in there? Do we ha can we ask the question about other f sources of social media or other Facebook pages? I think our people are getting information and sources of information, but not from a, not from our credible source of our own Facebook page. We're just just checking. The question, I believe, is an unprompted one, so it's an open question to people. Where do you get your sources of information about council from? And people volunteer that, and it gets coded. So the sources you're talking about, if people were mentioning it, they were coming to that 1% of other. Can I just have a pause, Mr Chair? Um, I've just, because Renelle's efficient, she's brought next year's quote in. Um, and next year's quote is 32,000. Last year's was within Cooey of that. Thank you. I'd expect nothing less from you, Jeremy. Councillor Rick Kurhek. Um, um, Renell, demographic, pro, oh, sorry, demographic profile, um, it, on page 193, 
uh, there's the profile of respondents. Does that reasonably closely match the actual demographic profile of the city? When we recruit to, um, when we do our sample for a telephone survey, we actually work to a quota. So we ensure that we've got a gender representation, um, age representation, and by ethnic group. But the final data is weighted to be proportionate to the census 2013 data. Unfortunately, the census 2018 data has not been released yet. So whether it's an accurate reflection of the population is <coughs> up for debate. Um, but we do weight the data back to be representative. Councillor Max Mason. Um, two questions, if I may. Um, is the first one is, um, uh, to Renelle, do you, with your um, six other um, city councils, do you ever differentiate between high growth councils and, or do, do you kind of know um, when, when you sort of in, in thinking about them whether th there'd be any difference between the high growth councils and the um, m you know, medium growth councils in terms of the result? Um, no. The, the short answer is no. Um, because we only have six, we haven't gone in depth. If we had 60, I could do more of an analysis on it. Um, there are some councils that I um, intuitively feel are more like Tauranga. You've got similar issues, but whether that's because they are high growth versus low growth, I, I can't answer for that. Thank you. And the second question is in relation to um, the community engagement, engagement on page 177. Um, so 67 of yours. I mean, that, that strikes me on the surface as being shockingly bad. Um, we know where community engagement, the way council involves the public in the decisions make 27%, um, it's, and it's dropped as well. Um, have you got a feeling for other councils um, around the country? Is, is it at a similar level? Or we, how do we compare? I'm trying to get a feeling for that. I unfortunately don't have that figure right with me at the moment, but I do think this is an area that city councils are struggling with, um, with increasingly diverse populations to engage all community groups in a sensible and relevant way. Um, I could definitely go back and look at a comparison for the six um, city councils for you and get back to you on that one. And the last question, if I may, um, is the, the page before that, the history of Tauranga, um, that, that also seems really bad. Um, 40, only 40 percent of people, um, you know, feel that they have a, uh, a an informed or very well informed uh, knowledge of the history of Tauranga. Um, and it seems that we can. There's all kinds of opportunities we can uh, do to improve that. But um, how, how do you think? Again, uh, sort of looking back at some of those other councils and cities, do you think that they would have a, a better or a similar score? Um, interestingly enough, you're the only council who's carrying this, count this specific question. Um, none are actually checking whether people know the history of these cities. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, can't comment. Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. Through the Chair, I just wonder what happens to all this data. Do the various departments of staff act on it, or does it sit on a shelf to compare with next year, I just wondered yeah, what we actually do with the data. For example, improving the history, knowledge of Tauranga, do we ask park, <coughs> excuse me, parks and reserves to do more signage, or you know, how does the information flow on in a helpful manner? So there's a mix of things. So one, as Jeremy's talked around in this report, it goes into the annual report, so it's giving pu public view to it. Um, it comes to elected members so that when you're making decisions about investment of resources, you can take those things into account. And it does also go to each of the departments and they can look at it and take that into account into their business plans, but they are unable to allocate additional resources unless that has elected member support. So where we're doing new projects and there's opportunity to improve add things into signage or other, we would do that, but we wouldn't initiate any new projects unless it was approved. Any further questions in relation to the resident survey? In which case, thank you. We have a recommended motion. 
in the agenda. Do I have a mover? Moved Councillor Steve Morris, seconded Councillor Catherine Stewart. Speaking to the motion, Councillor. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Look, it was a fascinating um, insight uh, into the views of 600 people over those three survey periods, and I think Councillor Brown's comments through the questions around you know, what can we take from this and learn and improve are really important. I don't, you know, I, I don't think we should just have this as a, a yearly occurrence where we receive the survey and sort of go, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I think there are some real opportunities here to improve. Um, using the, the power of uh, Google, I've gone and searched the date ranges when the um, three surveys were undertaken and searched for what the headlines were and the media during the three survey periods. Uh, and the first one was 16th November to 7th of December 18, last year. And the main headlines in the paper were around Tarrant City Council banning begging. That's not my words, that's the headline. Um, then Greerton traffic safety improvements was another, another big one. Uh, and then a new name proposed for Phoenix Park Te Papa and Namanu Pota Takataka. So that was all within uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, then the next period, there, it seems to be reasonably quiet um, in terms of, of headlines, although there was a headline around um, $128 million budget blowout, which, um, when, which actually disappeared. <laughs> um, and, and turned out it wasn't a blowout, dis disappeared. Um, but then also in the last uh, period, which is 3rd May to 30th May, that's when uh, Council uh, was deliberating the yearly rate increase. So uh, it'd be interesting to see what the responses were, I think, <coughs> for that first period. I think uh, the, the, the two other periods seem to be quite business as usual, but uh, there, was a, there was a lot of um, uh, contentious issues uh, either way you look at them in that first period. So it'd be interesting to see um, what the breakdown of the responses for that first period is, just for a, um, a perception versus media versus headlines, or, or whether it was actually different, whether it had any impact whatsoever in terms of perception, I don't know. But it'd be very interesting to have that, um, that breakdown in terms of the first uh, period. And so, question, <laughs> through you, Mr Chair, uh, through your um, your liberal and relaxed cheering, um, is it possible to get a breakdown of the results for the first period? Because I'd be interested to see whether they are different from the remainder. Who am I asking that question to? I, I assume the reason you're asking that that question through the chair at this point is to avoid having someone move an amendment to the substantive motion, and if we can informally get that question addressed, it would avoid that procedural issue. So uh, it's a question to staff. I think that question can be answered and staff will provide an answer. So that's done, Councillor. Second to speaking to the motion. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, it provides an interesting snapshot from a small part of our community and it may be a useful tool for the new council to have a copy of this to uh, read through. I find it interesting that People still prefer hard copies, uh, the Bay Times, Weekend Sun, um, and how low down the Council Facebook page is, given that so many people use um, Facebook. So I think the incoming Council may find it as a helpful tool. Further speakers to the motion? Uh, Councillor Max Mason. Uh, this. Uh, I guess, in con in, and in conjunction with the next uh, agenda item, um, the annual report is really, um, we, we're all um, should be having you know, performance reviews uh, in any uh, endeavour, and um, this is no difference. This is, to some extent, our performance review from the, from the community. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's some really good stuff here that, um, you know, our community really satisfied with certain things, and there's stuff that we really need to work on. Uh, and and I really would like a strong <coughs> uh, for the next council is to take a you know a very strong approach on really looking closely at these things, and I guess that's what democracy is um, is the community uh, deciding on what um, councillors um, standing for the next election 
uh, are going to promise and, uh, and deliver, but certainly it's, it's something for the staff to look at as well and together to make um, decisions, especially around um, <coughs> the engagement uh, and communication um, in our community is not satisfied um, with that and we we need to find better ways to do it it's not just not just us uh, it's other as uh, uh, Renell said it is other communities around the around the country uh, as well but we need to find better ways of, of communicating uh, myself I feel there's almost too much information out there um, and uh, a lot more targeted information to people that really want specific types of information and they go uh, towards it I'm sure there are ways of doing that. Uh, but I, I would also very much like to point out um, that in terms of uh, the knowledge that people feel that they, they know the history of the city, um, you know, there's only 40%. And that's, that's just really, really sad that people don't know, feel that 60% don't feel that they know the, 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 the history of their city. You know, how are they going to get engaged and to love this place and to, to grow roots here and, and, to and, and to be part of the community if they don't understand its history? It's like all of us. If we didn't know our own histories, so, you know, we, we we wouldn't be much at all. So, I just think that's 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 the biggest stare in my mind. And uh, you know, we talk. I mean, and obviously, what I'm talking about is a museum. But um, you know, if, if supposedly, you know, um, for, for, for 60% of people don't want a, a 55 million dollar museum. Well, you know, there's there's lots of margin in there for uh, people who do want to find their history. And this is saying 60% of people do. I'm not saying they do want history, but they. 60% don't know as much as they would like to. So I, th I think, um, yeah, that's, that's a sad reflection on us, and we should do better. Thank you. Councillor Leanne Brown. Um, thank you. Um, lots of interesting reading. I think what it's one thing that concerns me is the community's perception that we are hard to contact, and I don't think we are hard to contact. I think Council has... You know every form of, of communication available out there in terms of phone and email and website and and a myriad of social media pages and websites for every touch point of our of our um, organisation. So I think maybe we need to do some more work around letting people know how to contact council, but also councillors. We should we're all our contact details are on ev on our website. So maybe we all individually need to do some more work around that. I am concerned about the community engagement and the questions. That, that have been used to couch the information or to, to gauge the information because it's blurry about the difference between engagement, which actually should be called connecting with our community, and then consultation and then decision making because they're three very different processes and I think the words are blurry and people are uh, not sure on those different processes and we need to keep them very clear. So there's some work around that. I've been pushing Local Government New Zealand to focus more on community engagement and community connections and community communi communication because I don't think at this point there is any one council in New Zealand that has actually uh, hit the nail on the head and got it sorted. So um, it's, a, it's still a, a good area of focus for us. Any further speak? Councillor Kelvin Cloud. Thanks very much. Um, it's a fantastic. Um, snapshot, you might say, of the community's perceptions about our council, but also about our broader city. And I'll just um, draw attention to the question about homelessness. Now, four years ago, 57% uh, of residents believed there was an issue with homelessness. And now, uh, four years later, in fact, three years later, it's now up to 78%. So this really shows um, the fact that homelessness is an issue that is gaining greater awareness and concern around the community. That's a message to us um, in local government to do everything we can to ensure um, ease of, uh, of building houses and planning um, regulations, etc., so that we can enable housing, th particularly through our city plan. Um, and also it's a message to central government that, uh, that collectively we need to step up our game to address this um, very important issue. So that's just one snapshot. Um, but I encourage the community to um, look through this and, um, and come back to us with um, their concerns in, in a practical way. Just another example is um, the issue about the history, knowledge, lack of in this in the city and uh, the fact that um, those who are advocating for a museum um, have got plenty of ammunition to come back to us with. Yeah, Councillor Terry Malloy. Just um, in, in speaking to and supporting it, 
and uh, there are challenges in there for us. Just want to point out that you, we're going through a, a, a significantly challenging period at this point in time. You know, we've got huge growth. I don't think the growth of figures have ever matched this before. Um, homelessness is something that's really challenging for everybody. Begging, of course, is up there. Uh, transport, you know, the transport issues and the very, very few f quick fixes which uh, I don't think many people understand. It's, it's going to be a long, hard process to get that under control. Uh, the CBD transformation, that, that, the CBD transformation, I believe, is the biggest probably on history when you look at the dollar value of m money that's been spent in the CBD privately and by council, and what's going to happen there over the next five years is the largest ever, I believe, and that obviously poses you know, significant challenges. And then we've got others so, you know, to throw into the pot there that challenges our community in terms of how they view us. You know, Bella Vista, Greaton Road, uh, Te Papa Una Manu Pura, Takataka, Taka, uh, the Mount Base Track, all of these challenging little issues that we're trying to work our way through, um, you know, must make the community sort of regard us a little bit suspiciously. But, you know, they are massive challenges and there aren't easy answers. Thank you. Any further speakers to the motion? I'll take this opportunity as someone who has a, an affinity and experience with market research. It's not surprising I have a view. With regard to Councillor Mason's comments about performance reviews, of course the performance review for elected members is coming up and one way to avoid a performance review of course is to not stand for re-election. Um, with regard to research, with regard to research there is um, an old saw, which is those who use research the way a drunk uses a lamppost, more for support than illumination. And um, if we look, for instance, at the history question, and this reflects a concern expressed, and I, I agree with it by Councillor Baldock, that we have facts, but we don't have explanations in this research. In other words, we don't have the whys. People will choose to attribute wise in the absence of quality information. One reason why people may not have a good knowledge of the history of the city is that it is a growth city. A tremendous number of people haven't been here for long. It's also unwise, in my view, to suggest that not having that knowledge is a cause for concern from them. When one looks at other parts of the research, we see that those things that have the most impact on their view of us are the good old standards of financial management, faith and trust, property rates fair and reasonable. These are the things that have the biggest impact, apparently, um, according to the research. I think there is a need for benchmarking. Um, it's been a request of a number of people in terms of questioning the report, the idea where do we stand relative to others? Because, of course, relative is important. You know, your score may be the best in the country, but it may not be what you aspire to. You don't know if you don't have that benchmarking. Um, I have a personal view, and I think it's an interesting segue that the next topic will be the annual report, that one of the reasons that we have a level of community disengagement across the country is that councils and, po councils and politicians in particular seem to lack the ability to tell a balanced story. They seem to take it upon themselves to attempt to win with spin. Um, and again, I'm sure the next two months we'll see plenty of that happening in the city. My advice to anyone listening online or who listens to this later is please do your research. I'm a big fan of it. Um, in that regard, look, thank you for the effort. It does probably, like most good research, raise more questions than it answers. I never forget my first um, consultancy gig when the founder of the company made the point to me that, remember, your first recommendation must be further research is required, and if you want to understand why that's always the first recommendation, is researchers have to eat. Um, in that regard, I suggest we need to feed key research or someone else more because the questions that have been asked around this table are good questions, but frankly, this information doesn't, and 
is unable to answer them, but they are good questions and we should seek to understand them. The why question is the most critical question and it doesn't provide us with that and nor should it for the small amount we put into it. So I'm happy to support the motion as it sits on the table, but I would love to see us and I, I think I have the sympathy of some colleagues. I know Councillor Baldock is a big fan of researching um, what the community wants and I think this is a good thing. I think there are opportunities for it. I think we miss them at our peril. So I support the motion. Uh, the mover like to speak in reply? In which case I'll put the motion. All those in favour please say aye. aye. Against abstentions carried. <coughs> we shall break for 15 minutes. We shall be back at 11.02. Just to close a loop, can I just have your attention for two seconds? And the first tranche was reported to AFRAM on the 19th of February 2019. So if you want to go back, it's not as comprehensive as this, but the big headline stuff is in there. Um, and the biggest negative in that period was value for money from the Tapapa of people, people, which may well lead to grit and who knows. Thank you, Jeremy.
welcome back colleagues. The next item on the agenda is DC 261, the draft annual report for the year ended 30 June 2019. Uh, good morning, select members. Um, so you've got in front of you the draft annual report um, for the end of 2000, uh, June 2019. Uh, there's been a, a big push from all staff to get this draft um, into you by early August. So normally we have uh, about another month, um, but obviously with um, the election and the timing for adoption of the final report, we've done our best to bring to you um, the draft. With the, the financials are, are currently being reviewed by audit, so there will be some changes in there. Um, uh, and you'll see there's a mix of final publi published format um, <laughs> for the early parts of it, and then a lot of it's still in the um, base format. So if it looks a little untidy, that's what's going on there. Um, but we have tried to br bring as many of the notes as possible in um, to their final state. Um, the front part of the document, which is um, the, the, the welcome, the conversation from the CE, and the highlight section, um, again, is in draft, and we are inviting elected members to give us feedback on that. Uh, there's a couple of items I'll call out. One is in the financial highlights. I'm missing a paragraph about the standard and pause credit rating upgrade, which will go in. Um, and in the financial section at the back, we hadn't updated the commentary around the performance benchmarks. Um, so it's referring to 2018. Um, the outcome is the same this year. We have met all but one, which relates to rates um, increases, and that rates increase total relates to the fact that we're growing and between the time that we projected a revenue amount and the actual revenue received, um, there was a small difference. Uh, so if we go to uh, the cover report, I've um, kind of highlighted key matters from the annual report. Uh, the first is this is um, just, we're just asking you to receive the report and we are inviting feedback uh, and setting a date as 20th of August for that feedback because there's quite a bit of toing and froing for us to get that into published form and um, and, and tied up with the audit. Uh, I think that was maybe. Um, so if we just look at the summary of issues, I've pulled out the main financial um, highlights. These are very similar to what we've been bringing to you all year through your monthly and quarterly monitoring. So our total net debt by year end was um, pretty much as budgeted in, in the LTP, uh, $441 million. Uh, it's been our biggest ever year of capital delivery, so um, that, that's very exciting. And we've give, we've got a breakdown in the highlight section around um, what has been delivered. A debt to revenue ratio is, is close to budget. Um, development contributions revenue again is close to budget, and a very small at the stage rate surplus, um, which I've given you for information. But because we're subject to audit, this sort of always um, changes that we're required to make relating to the timing of recognition of revenue and expenditure, so that that is likely to change slightly. Um, so I'll hand over to Ben. For Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm also uh, deputising for the corporate planning team leader today, so I will try to answer any of the questions on the non financial performance side. Anything I cannot answer, um, I'll obviously take away and look to follow up or bring through into the next version. Just to echo Catherine's um, points there, the time frame has been very tight for this first version with local elections and whatnot, so we are uh, trying to provide as much information as possible. Would welcome any feedback always. Um, in particular, from our point of view, we'd like to know that the content and the structure and the narrative um, the elected members are happy with in, in terms of how we're aiming to present this annual report. Um, so yeah, happy to take any questions from there, really. Thank you. Councillor Larry Baldock. Thank you. Um, and always acknowledge the hard work that goes into it all. Um, just in the in the covering report, paragraph ten, um, 
total residential rating units has increased by 2.6 percent, and then while commercial rating units have increased point by 0.4 to 58,361, is that commercial rating units? Because it's very close to the residential number, and I just wondered if that's correct. That's total, so that's the total number of all rating units. So if you refer to um, the, the rating funding impact statement is in here and it will break it down. So it's about three and a half thousand odd commercial and the rest is residential. So then on your bigger sheet here where we have 58,640 number of homes, that's obviously not seen <coughs> as individual rating units then, is it? Um, so um, I, no, it's understandable, I suppose, an apartment maybe, or or, um, or uh, retirement villages or what? Right? So I just wanted to clarify so that it was clear, that was all. Uh, we, we'll go back and clarify and, and, and probably make sure there's a footnote if we, we keep the different numbers that explains that difference. The other is in the, um, and I'll sound like a broken record here, but I noticed both the Mayor and the Chief Executive Lord, the 2,200 tonnes of glass that was diverted from landfills, but you can't lord that unless that is an increase, and we haven't yet had an answer back on what it was before the curbside collection, because glass was going, glass was being diverted from our transfer stations anyway. I'm still wanting to see that it has resulted in an actual increase in diversion, or just simply people are now putting it at the gate instead of going to the transfer station. We'll, we'll try to obtain that clarification for the next version. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Leanne Brown. So how do you want to handle um, sort of typos or in incorrect information? Like page 26, we've got creative tauranga instead of creative bay of plenty. So do you want us just to mark them on our copies and give them to you? Would that be the easiest way of handling I'll happily take any feedback you have, particularly with wording and typos. I think I would just say, though, that um, we will be reviewing this as we go through the next version, but anything you wish to pass through, we'll happily receive. Thank you. And the Chair would much prefer that in a series of emotions with regard to apostrophes and full stops and capitals. Um, Councillor Rick Kurak. Uh, thank you. Just further to uh, Councillor Baldock's uh, query around the, the rating units. Um, previously, I recall there had been two numbers, the number of um, rating units, which, is, which, in, which includes properties where there are a number of dwellings, like multi-dwelling um, properties. And we used to record two, the number of, total number of dwellings, or whatever, how it was phrased, I'm not sure, uh, sure and then also rating units. So it'd be helpful to, if we can include that, just to differentiate between the, the, the two. Councillor Kelvin Clout. Thank you. Just um, one query I've got on page 211 of the agenda, which is page, I'm not sure, uh, page 7, I think, of the annual report draft. Just um, talking about Bella Vista, and it talks about the um, proceeds that we uh, received from the insurance payout, and then obviously um, the shortfall from what we paid out to the homeowners. So if you compare that to the um, earlier DC uh, 204, the Bella Vista update, it looks like there's the GST component has been included in the annual report, um, as opposed to the figures that we saw earlier in DC 204, which looks like they were excluding GST. So I just want to make sure that there's the, the right um, sort of uniform treatment of that because presumably the GST is really irrelevant for this for us, so if you can clarify that and make sure that's um, excluded, that'll be good. Thank you. Thank you. Two, two more, if I can, and probably directed to Christine, um, page 218, a challenge with development capacity. 
During the next one to three years, there will be an undersupply of around a thousand homes. Uh, I'm just wondering if that's a bit light, given what we know. We, if one to, I would think, it's the bottom of 218. I'll let, wait till you find it there. Um, I mean, we don't want to be too alarmist, but you know, the, if it was one to two years, that would be about right. But one to three. Um, Go back and have a look at the um, the work that we did. I, th I think our one to three was okay because we still had a few thousand lots. It's beyond that point when it starts to get really tight, but we can check it. I thought we had about fifteen hundred lots in line that would, but but our annual annual is, up is, a, is you know over the thousand. So yeah. anyway, that one yep. and then yep. on just over the page, newer suburbs Wairaki and Paispa West, fifty percent built and consented. Um, either there's a lot more unbuilt in Wairaki than the lakes, but I mean the lakes is almost gone. Can you just check on that too? I just uh, yeah, that's cor that's correct. It is mainly Wairaki's. Uh, it's mainly Pies Paris, um about eighty percent full, I think. Yeah. yeah. And my final one there, just for this thing, is on the next page two two one, um, probably back to. Or probably to Paul, but but Catherine also. But just this, our risk reserve is in deficit by 15.5. You know, the average person can only interpret that as it looks like a credit card. You know, you've you've spent the money, and there's a big hole. And we know that's not the correct. That's that's based on what we project our deficit to be, not what we've actually spent, as I understand from our discussions at a recent meeting. And I just think it's sort of and you can't explain it really because it's just the way we operate. But it's not a good, not a good little box that one. Through the, through the chair, um, we can put some more words in to clarify it. But I think it, it, it is important that we recognise that, um, but that there is a liability effectively for the provisioning of leaky home expenses in particular, which does push that into deficit. But yeah, but but, but yeah, but it, but it is also making the definition of a provision is more likely than not. So we just want to be clear around that, but we can add some words to that. Yeah, I, th I think some additional words would be helpful there. I think that many people, it's a bit like the research we discussed before the break. People will see a number, they will attribute a why to it in the absence of facts and information. That why will often be politically or ideologically driven behoves us to put the information in the public domain to ensure that people are operating on a well-informed basis. Councillor Rick Kurak. Um, yeah, just looking at some of those uh, key numbers uh, represented on page 221, at the bottom it's got the council status, 11% of net, net assets of 3.9 billion. Um, but in terms of um, the average reader, in terms of the public, um, I would suggest it would be better to have it expressed as um, debt per, per um, household or per rating unit or something. You know, it just puts it into a better context for the average reader. So I'll just leave that with you, but you know, debt percentage um, versus assets is a, you know, to me it's a bit you know, meaningless. The only comment I wish my debt was down <laughs> to that level. <coughs> I mean, it's quite different, your personal finances compared to public ones. A public one would be more relative to um, the debt, the, the public debt, compared to you know, my property I, I'm yeah, per household. Yeah. I'm hearing here, as the chair, a request, Councillor Correct, for staff to consider whether that's an appropriate measure of debt to assets or whether debt to assets is a relevant measure for something like a council. I have some sympathy with that as a question if Councillor Baldock, heaven forfend, was to go belly up, most of his assets would be highly liquidatable and they could pay his debtors. Um, council isn't in that situation. Um, selling the land under roads would be highly 
unlikely in the case. So I, I think there is some discussion that needs to be had around the relevance of some of our highlight figures. Um, I take advice from staff as to where that could happen, possibly in the context of putting together the annual report, which has had no real input from elected members, whether there needs to be a workshop done on the performance snapshot so that elected members can give some guidance as to the highlights that are pulled out to ensure, of course, balance. Um, but I'll take advice from staff. Through the chair, what I suggest is that what we can do is do some research around what other councils are disclosing as well in this space, not, not confirming that it's the right or the wrong thing, but we can come back with some advice to elected members before we adopt on the, the 17th of September. And while we're on that topic, I would ask that we look at giving clarity around our net debt situation and how much of it is actually ratepayer debt, which is obviously of interest to our ratepayers. Um, you know, and obviously some of the sources of our debt. I took a position very clearly with regard to the last annual report that we have a significant amount of debt that sits on our balance sheet as a result of effectively the under collection of development contributions, a contribution we've made to the wealth of various developers in our city effectively, tab being picked up by the ratepayers. And for some reason, we don't have that very large figure highlighted. Now, admittedly, it, one could perhaps describe it more as a low light than a highlight, but it is a large number that's relevant to the debt carried on our balance sheet. And again, it comes back to informing our community, particularly when occasion that community hears from developers about how little risk the council's prepared to bear in certain things. And of course, that circles nicely back to the risk reserve issue raised by another councillor. Um, you know, what is that risk we're carrying and who is the original source would also be something that should be of interest, I believe, to our community. Yeah, if we can just make comment that um, page 225 of actually now showing that, that split of debt, um, but we'll um, uh, take note of um, the additional wording around the, um, the, the growth transfer to rate, rate pay funded debt. Further questions? I have Councillor Max Mason. <coughs> have a couple. Um, just a, I guess a question of perhaps it's not quite format, but going back to the um, performance review analogy, um, normally in a performance review one has uh, uh, KPIs that are um, not achieved, achieved or exceeded. And I'm just wondering, you know, this is, it seems to me when, when I read this, um, it's not balanced. If, if you look at the, sorry, the non-financial performance summary, I beg your pardon. Um, page 232, um, this sort of gives us, it's almost got a slightly negative, all uh, you've achieved or you, or you haven't achieved. And um, al although there has been over the page a couple of bullet points, we've had a number of notable measures and there's three bullet points there about how some, um, some of the KPIs have been achieved. Um, I just wonder if, if it's worthwhile putting a bit more um, sort of content to that or I don't know whether the, this is a statutory um, uh, you know how this is actually laid out. Um, I'm not sure who I'm asking the question to, but you know, is there potentially more scope for a more balanced view? Because there's a lot of things that have been exceeded and have done extremely well, and it's always good. And and you always by ex by measuring when things are uh, KPIs exceeded, um, you get more of a of a of an impetus to want to succeed rather than just stop where you've been, when you've achieved something. Um, I can try to answer that. Um, in terms of our our long-term plan, we do set out the way in which we measure um, non-financial performance over those three years. So that's quite rigid in terms of how we report against them and how we can frame them. Um, there is some further information and breakdown. This just provides a summary. Uh, in the groups of activities, um, there is further discussion around each of those measures and how we may have been close to them. Um, but effectively, we are uh, bound by the long-term plan and how we, how we measure and report. Um, <coughs> yep. So. I think in terms of what one of the things about this is that it's a communication device and a lot of people, especially when it comes to the summary, I'd say that probably there's only a handful of people who ever look at the, the main thing, um, the document, but when it comes to the summary, um, that's what people see as what the reality is. And I don't know, it's just something to, 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 to perhaps put out there that it, um, I, I would like to see the performance of the organisation more clear, balanced in a, in a summary form, but that's just for you as a staff to to, uh, to, to
consider. The second question is um, in terms of staff turnover, page 259 at 12%. Um, is that reasonable? Is that, um, I've got an, an idea we might increase or decrease that, um, Susan, potentially? Clearly, my ability to multitask is, <laughs> it's not working. I was listening literally until a minute ago. Right. I suffer from the same, uh, the same problem, I can assure you, uh, as my wife will testify on numerous occasions. Um, the four staff um, turnover um, is 12% uh, in the previous year, and the, the year before that was 14%. Um, is your intention as um, in the HR role is to, um, to reduce that, or is that about right? Is that a healthy turnover? Can you give us just a little bit of, of uh, what does it indicate? Sort of some, indi in some, some commentary around that. My view is that 10% is a reasonable amount of churn and most organisations would want an amount of churn and the, the goal is never zero. I think we, we have fluctuated between 12 and 14% which is reasonable and comparable. I would note that a 7% you know, turnover or 10% turnover gives you an average life of say 10 years in position or in the organisation. It's, it's interesting to, to, to reframe the question becomes interesting. Um, further questions with regard to the report or the draft and the report itself? Chair, your indulgence, with, it's not a question, it's, a, it's a, a comment about possibly something that's missing here that I would like to see in it. Happy to hear. Okay. Um, I think w one of the most important aspects of, of what we do both um, within our own lo locality but also the wider sub-region is relationships. <coughs> and um, we've got an annual resident survey which um, gives us a feel for that relationship or how they feel about us. But I, I wouldn't, I would, I'd quite like to see a relationship like a, a health barometer for example that gives us a, a feeling for um, how, how we are regarded and how we regard them the likes of Western Bay of Plenty, the Regional Council, the, the Smart Growth Team, NZTA possibly, you know, EMS and, and staff, and Tangata Whenua. You know, th th those relationships, I believe, in terms of this council going forward and being successful are absolutely critical. But I don't see anywhere where we have a barometer that says how those relationships are. In some of those areas, I know it from time to time they've been poor, and some of them have been good, but we should have an understanding of that so that we can actually do something about it if, if, if it is poor. And uh, so, uh, you know, I'd, in, instead of us just all arbitrarily making our own minds up as to how that those relationships sit, for example, it'd be quite interesting to see how Western Bay and the Regional Council would rate the relationship of one to ten with us, and conversely, we with them. Quite interesting to see how that, that came out, um, because in terms of working for the benefit of, of the whole of the sub-region, it's critical that those relationships are good. So I'd just like to see a, a measure somewhere so we understand what, where that is in the annual report or. I'll let that. Um, I'm happy to, yeah, Christine, if you comment. Thank you. Um, so you could do that type of survey. The question for this report, though, is that relevant for the annual report? And that's more around the report of an organisation's overall performance um, in terms of the commitment and the contract that it has with the community in terms of what you said you were going to do in your annual plan and what you actually deliver in terms of your annual report as your accountability. Um, saying that there's no reason why you couldn't do the sort of thing you're talking about, but that might just be um, information for elected members. And you'd need to be clear, are you trying to understand their... Um, perception of the organisation or of management and how they work at a senior level or at elected member level because I think they're quite different things and we have quite different interactions with we have those three types of interactions with regional council and Western Bay so once you were clear on that you could create a survey and target it in the right place and that might be just informal information for elected members and the CE. The, the Chair, I'd, I'd certainly like to have that discussion to, s to see what how we feel about it and, and uh, if we want to do anything about it. Perhaps, Councillor, we can address that informally amongst the elected members and if there's a will in 
informally to raise it as a formal issue and discuss it with staff, that's the way to proceed. Any further questions of the report? There's a lot there. Um, it would appear, Catherine, you've stumped the panel. Um, <laughs> in, if there are no further questions in relation to the financial and non-financial performance, uh, effectively the draft annual report narrative, I'm looking, I have a um, motion from Councillor Kelvin Clout. Um, we have a seconder. Seconded Mayor Greg Brownless speaking to the motion, Councillor. Yeah, thanks very much. Obviously, uh, thanks a lot to the staff who've put a lot of effort into putting this together. Um, I do note that it is still at draft stage, so I believe you've got a, about a month to um, respond to some of the feedback we've given. Um, it certainly provides an accurate um, reflection on Council's performance over the last year, uh, good, bad, bad and ugly. Um, and so for anyone who cares to delve into the depths of it, um, good luck. Uh, and uh, we look forward to signing this off officially, I think it's the 17th of September. Thank you. Second to wish to speak. Of course, reports will um, paint um, people and organisations in the light that they, that they wish, but I think that, um, of course, um, we are positive about the future of the city at the same time as recognising in here, if you look, uh, some of the difficulties that we have experienced um, and that's uh, been reflected in a number of reports that we've ordered into uh, problems that we've had and um, I think that's good. It's a, a good balance of uh, telling it like it is um, and also um, showing that the future under the right um, course management and once we get everything right w is good. So that's all I can say. Further speakers to the motion? Councillor Max Mason. <coughs> um, I was going through my uh, study at home, <coughs> uh, chucking out all of my uh, old council papers and bringing a big bag of them into me, to, uh, turned around uh, <coughs> in, the, uh, in the bin outside. Um, uh, I was sort of reflecting on what I would uh, take away from these three years um, in the uh, being somebody who was elected first time around, that uh, gave me satisfaction. Um, and uh, it was, uh, <coughs> I, I thought the, the, the things that really, really do encapsulate council really well are the annual reports. So I, I chucked out everything else and I'll keep the, the, the two current uh, reports and, uh, and, and this one when it is um, published. And uh, it gives me a lot of pride, um, actually. There's a huge amount of things to work with the team, uh, particularly the staff who, um, who put a massive amount of effort in. Uh, absolutely the unsung heroes, in my opinion. Um, and uh, you know they, uh, I, I think that the senior management team is, is going to do a, a fantastic job uh, in the years ahead. Um, and um, I, I do note the non-financial performance summary. I just want to, um, I guess, reiterate my belief that uh, this is almost like the, it's the tail wagging the dog in these types of reports and in local government, where the whole purpose we are here is for the non-financial performance. Those are the levels of service, and yet there seems to be less. Um, focus on that and there's far more focus on financial performance uh, and financial ma management uh, as there should be but when it comes to reporting there's so much more emphasis on, on, on the financial side and less on how well we're actually de de delivering those levels of service but um, I think 68% of the non-financial performance measures I think to ind indicates um, something that we should perhaps put more effort into the management of those um, if you look sort of at the, at the detail of some of them um, there are um, uh, perhaps um, uh, you think why, why is this particular measure not being um, measured um, now um, in, in this report there's I think there's eight percent of them or so um, that is not not actually measured I think that they should be folk, um, you know arranged so that the, the majority of them are so we can actually have a, 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 a good accurate measurement at the end of the year for our for our community um, so that we should work on that and uh, I think that the 68%, I really would like to see that see that go up, and so would our community. Um, but just, just some, some highlights for me. The awards and recognition uh, table on page 238. I think, uh, you know, huge, huge congratulations to the staff, particularly on those. Uh, it shows that there's a, you know, when an organisation's putting itself forward for, um, 
rewards and they're winning them, uh, I think it, it, it says there's a degree of pride, uh, and I, I really endorse that. Uh, I think also the page uh, 242, the w working with Tangata Whenua, uh, I am also proud uh, to have been part of a council that is, um, has done, uh, you know, there's always a lot of work to do, more work, but um, I think we've, we've made a lot of progress in that area, and I, I am very happy to be part of a council for that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a good document. Uh, I would definitely um, encourage the, uh, the, 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 the community to have more of an understanding uh, of the council because it means so much to their lives. And it's only by understanding and reading these things and how we communicate it that the community really understands. And I still think that the, the level of understanding the community has of what the council does and the impact on their lives is unfortunately um, lower than it should be. Further speakers, Councillor Terry Malloy. Just briefly, if I may, through the chair, I, you know, I think we've been through uh, and are going through the most challenging period uh, the city's ever ever faced, um, and possibly will for some time. Um, I would seriously recommend uh, our, our community sit down and, if they get a chance, and read this document. And I would hope that it would be the basis uh, for any commentary going forward because it's, it is a good document, but uh, I won't actually hold my breath on that one. Thank you. Any further speakers to the motion? Speaking from the chair, I'd make the observation that <coughs> I think the annual report's probably one of the most important publications we produce along with our annual plans and long-term plans. Um, this one obviously has been subject to a three, what that three yearly time pressure, and there's been a lot of work to bring as much as has been brought before us in the time frame, and I thank the staff for that. <coughs> in response to those who talk about, you know, the value of the information of this report, it's sad that key research were unable to identify or break out anyone who used the annual report as a source of information about council. The annual report doesn't feature there at all. Um, <coughs> the annual report does demonstrate to a degree the complexity of council. Councillor Leanne Brown has observed many times the number of activities, the number of effectively business areas we're in. And I don't think people do appreciate. I think that failure is ours think we fail to communicate it and sometimes when we do communicate we communicate when we try to communicate we use our language rather than the language of our community it doesn't help and every time that we put something out that is clearly not balanced it undermines that little bit of trust that they have in the good work that we do and it poisons the well for the good reports that we do produce. And we do produce them, just not enough, not often enough, and we don't impart them well enough. Um, I'm happy to support the motion, noting um, for the benefit of some of my colleagues that supporting the motion at this stage to receive the draft report does not ensure that I will support the substantive motion which will be coming to us with regard to adopting the final report. I would hope that staff reflect upon the request by more than one member to workshop, if you like, the headlines that we're putting in here so that we can get the balance necessary for me to change the position I adopted some 12 months ago with regard to an annual report. It didn't stop the mayor then subsequently appointing me to be the chair of finance and audit and risk committee, which is responsible and effect for the annual report, but I make that point very clearly. Uh, so I hope staff have heard that and I hope we can make that, you know, deliver on that undertaking somewhere. Um, any further speakers to the report? In reply, Councillor? In which case I'll put the motion on the table. Those in favour please say aye. Aye. Against? Abstentions? Thank you. Apologies. We now move to the next item of the agenda, which is, I think, DC 255.
Land Investigation and Disposal Program Q4 Update. Good morning. Uh, you've got in front of you the quarter four and uh, full financial year update for the 2018-19 financial year for our land investigation and disposal program. Um, just a couple of points to, to make. Um, we, the total revenue received for the period uh, net revenue was 3.491 million. Uh, this is 40%, 46 percent of the anticipated uh, revenue. Uh, that for the for the year, uh, I'll draw your attention to clause seven also, where we'd highlighted the there were two properties which didn't proceed in the current financial year. There's actually a couple more which apologies I didn't include. Uh, one of them was 60 Chapel Street, which is under contract but is not yet unconditional. Uh, the other one is one of the lots in the Marine Precinct, which is due to settle this Friday. And thirdly, uh, Sandhurst Drive, which hasn't yet uh, proceeded to, um, to settlement. Um, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Councillors, any questions of the report? My apologies, Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. Um, I don't know in this forum or not, but um, could we have um, an update on Chapel Street for the delays in that, please? Uh, so the contract for Chapel Street was signed in December 2018. Uh, it is a conditional contract, so a, at the point that the contract becomes unconditional, it will form part of the a receipt of sale, if you like, um, and the, or the conditional date is the 31st of January 2020. So we're working through the various conditions, including lease negotiations and statutory requirements. Councillor Leanne Brown. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just for future, for the future accuracy in point nine, um, I think we're referring to October 2019, not 18. So maybe you should just correct that. So anyone who reads this report in the future the correct year in there. It's not, not important for today, but for future records it might be. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? Councillor Larry Baldock? Um, just querying the, the title, Land Investigation and Disposal Program, has the, have all of the sales within the Marine Precinct previously been reported under that title? You mentioned one of them, I think, was Marine Precinct, which is more of a it's not so much a, you know, in my interpretation of the title, it's not really a disposable disposal of surplus land. It's a, it's an investment or it's a project we worked on to return an investment to the council. Um, can you clarify? Were all the other ones part of this? Yep. So the um, the land investigation and disposal program reports on all of the sales, that, that whether they're through projects or otherwise, um, and the. We'd previously reported on one disposal, um, but the remaining four transactions occurred in quarter four of the last financial year. So, yeah. Thank you, Donna. Any other questions? <coughs> in which case, there is a recommended motion in the agenda. Do I have a mover for the motion? Councillor Max Mason seconded. Councillor Larry Baldock speaking to the motion, Councillor? Seconder. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? In which case, there being nothing to reply to, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against. Abstentions. Carried. Colleagues, we now move to DC 250. Legal issues. We have an execution of documents tables, DC 250. Uh, kia ora, councillors. Um, I think it's quite self explanatory. Um, if there's any questions on it, I can 
uh, direct the appropriate person to come back and um, give you the response, but um, I'm sure you'll take it as read. Councillors, any questions in relation to this report? The tables. Read the appendix, so I imagine my colleagues, Councillor Kelvin Clout. Thanks very much. On the first page of the agenda or the appendix, um, 19.145, the Tauranga Moana Outrigger Canoe Club. Is that the one that was looking for some from land down um, on the edge of Waikerio Estuary? Is that the, the place or is that the one down um, by Sulphur Point on Keith Allen Drive? Is that the one? Because I know there was a club who was looking to lease some land, if you remember rightly, during our reserves discussion. I just wasn't sure if it was that one or not. So. Chair, I, I don't know the details, but I do know that Taronga Milano Club is the club itself a point. Yeah. Councillor Max Mason. Um, I wonder if I could ask about the, um, the Taronga Mini Golf. <coughs> It's two quarters of the way down. Um, I thought that was the. Is that the one that is at the Memorial Park? Because <coughs> I thought that was Lions or somebody. Yeah, I don't have the specific issue, um, the specific contract in front of me, but I can come back to you on that point, um, whether it's Lions or not. Yeah, and just also the, what the length of lease is, please, because there's other um, sort of. <coughs> Um, you know, there's a memorial park um, um, investigation going on around that. Um, so just a little bit of detail, perhaps, about that. Yep, Thank you can get, some, get you some detail on that. Yes. Any other? Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. On page 501, um, document number 19-172, uh, heads of agreement, the trustees of Otamataha Trust and the Elms Foundation. Um, I'm just a bit surprised to see that that's been executed at this stage. If someone could comment, please. Councillor Bullock, you wish to comment? preempt the staff responding but it's pretty clear in my mind that we requested the chief executive to enter into a heads of agreement to sort out terms <coughs> that were acceptable to both parties and we saw that reported back to us and and that then leads to the next phase which we decide on the 27th of August which will be a formal lease <coughs> that is acceptable to both parties so there's no cost there there's no it's not a sign that it's a predetermined thing or it's you know been been transferred or anything. It was what we requested <coughs> under that resolution way back. And <laughs> uh, perhaps we could ask Dana, can you? I don't know the history of this, this issue, sorry. Thank you, Dana. Um, so the Heads of Agreement is a non-binding document which was entered into between the Otamataha Trust, the Arms Foundation and Council, which summarised the literally a heads of terms on what an agreement for sale and purchase would look like and agreed lease terms. This is the basis on which we could proceed with our community consultation, as some of the details were included in the community consultation documents, and uh, will also be, as um, Councillor Bordock's indicated, will be included in the deliberations report with further detail um, for, for consideration as to whether to proceed on those terms or otherwise. You comfortable with that, Councillor? Thank you. Any further questions in relation to this report or the items in the table in the appendix? There being no further questions, there's a recommended motion in the agenda. Do I have a mover? Moved Councillor Kelvin Clout, seconded Councillor Leanne Brown. Speaking to the motion, Councillor? Seconder? Anyone else wish to speak? There being no need for reply, we'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Abstentions? Carried. <coughs> we now move to the 
next item on the agenda, which I believe is DC 258, quarterly update on Lagoimas. I can talk to that. Thank you. Uh, so DC 258 reflects a schedule of information requests made under the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act for a three month period from April through June. Uh, there are two appendices, one which you see here in the open section of the agenda, um, requests made essentially by media and organisations, and a second appendix in the confidential section which is uh, requests made by individuals. So it is our intention in the next triennium to publish this information where appropriate on our website and be as transparent as we can. So at that point, uh, I might suggest that we report the information to you a little differently, perhaps some trends to you in a regular catch up rather than a report structure like this. But welcome any questions or feedback. Councillor Kelvin Crown. Thanks a lot, Susan. Can you explain why on some Lagoimas we record the staff time and others we don't. Um, I'm just interested as to why we don't have a consistent approach. My understanding is that some requests are so quick it's almost not worth capturing the time. Others are more difficult to capture given that it gets there's different parts of the organisation providing different responses. Supplementary <laughs> councillor or you? Just there might be something we need to consider you know further down the track as to whether we want to well in terms of those very short ones I can understand but um, where there's more complexity around the organization I think it would still be worthwhile recording that but um, maybe not for right now but we should have a discussion about that in the spirit of councillor Gail McIntosh timesheets 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 councillor Rick Kurek. We've given some are very uh, brief in terms of uh, the information required. What actually constitutes a, a Lagoima request? Is, does the person need to put in there that it's a Lagoima query, or is any query from the public to council regarded as a under the Lagoima Act? We answer that one for you, sir. Jacinda. Would you like to talk to the detail? Um, through the chair, so it's not necessary for a requester to say it is officially a Lagoima. Um, so just any request for information we should treat as a Lagoima. Um, as you'd be aware, we get a number of requests from media which technically are a Lagoima, but often because of their time frames, you know, and the, we, we try and respond to those as quickly as possible. Um, I think as Susan has alluded to, we're just, uh, um, with the, the establishment of a new team, we're trying to be as responsive and open and transparent as possible. Also thinking about how we, can we get more information out so it's more readily accessible for the community to find the information they're looking for rather than having to actually ask for it. So it's, it's part of our longer term process to try and just make sure we're being as open and user friendly as possible. But it, um, people don't have to uh, say it is a Lagoima for it to be treated as a Lagoima request. Supplementary, in terms of being responsive, like the, is it 20 days, the Lagoima requirement? So, yeah, yes, it so is. it's not you know, a, a consideration really in terms of um, some really simple uh, request for information. You try and get uh, back to, uh, to the person as soon as possible or practicable. Yes, through the chair, yes, that's correct. So if it's a simple question, we'll try and, um, if it, it's information that's already out there and we can direct the requester to it really promptly, we'll deal with that. Um, the contact centre who obviously deal with a number of the requests coming in the first instance, if they can find the answer and refer the requester to it promptly, that will happen and it may not even get referred to the newly established team. Um, and again, if, if it's unclear what the request is looking for, we will pick up the phone or communicate with them and just try and understand what is it exactly they're looking for, what we can provide, and, and how we can handle that in the best way for them. Just uh, some feedback I recall um, years ago in terms of, the, also in terms of the perception survey, people used to be really impressed with the amount of knowledge the average uh, person working in the call centre had obviously it required a lot of training, they'd go, wow, you know, that person who answers the phone could answer most questions. Is that still an aim of the organisation?
information in terms of that uh, that inter or direct interface with that person in the call centre, being having quite a broad knowledge of the organisation and the ability to answer many questions. Uh, yes, my understanding is that it's it's definitely the aim to develop our people. There's recently been a project, I think they call it the knowledge base, where they capture all of the typical questions they may get asked, and they got up to about two and a half thousand questions which they have captured in that knowledge base, which if you plug in trigger words, the answer will come up, and they can respond directly to the customer in real time. If only councillors were so able. Um, <laughs> Councillor Leanne Brown. Now that triggers a question, um, <laughs> why councillors don't have access to that, because often we can probably answer a lot of questions for our, resi for our um, residents a whole lot quicker rather than have to waste staff time, so maybe that's something for consideration. If it's easy enough, we don't have a, um, access to objectives, so depending on the platform, it would be, I think, helpful for councillors. Uh, but before, before you go on, councillor, Susan, you recognise that? Can we know uh, that? Yeah, I do. That's a sensible suggestion. So Thank you. I'll find out, and sure. then you know. Because we also don't have access to Insider either, which does contain a lot of helpful uh, internal uh, information. But just in terms of accuracy, there are a number of dates on this report. We have received it, and it's been closed prior to the receiving date. So we can just make sure that those dates actually align correctly in the report. Because uh, one we received on the 2nd of May, but we closed it on the 27th of March in the same year. So just some accuracy would be great. So we can keep an eye on those turnover times. Thank you. Councillor Larry Baldock. We're dealing with these requests with the speed of lightning, it seems. Um, Susan, just before when you said that next year you're looking at putting this up on the website, but the ones that are in confidential now, will they go up on the web top? Because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious why they are actually in confidential. I mean, people want to request a Lagoima. I kind of think they should. their name should be out there. Uh, I think where, where a question might relate just to someone's personal question about their own home, there may not be any need for it to be on a website. Uh, I, we had actually thought of redacting names or identifiers and the information if we were to publish it, if it was of interest. Well, I think the, the repeated requests from someone like Rob Patterson are not to do with his personal home. So I just would like to know why those things are treated confidential. I think the public would like to know sometimes who, who are repeatedly engaging in this Lagoima game and costing ratepayers money for very little gain, really. That might be a discussion we need to have, Jacinda. Yeah, I'd, I'd counsel the councillor with regard to calling Lagoima a game. Um, it's, actually, it's actually a significant and some believe a very worthwhile adjunct to the process of governance in New Zealand and um, I, I will agree that some people are, how can I put it, somewhat enthusiastic adopters of that privilege but the going run itself obviously is not a game I'm, and I'm sure you understand that. So. Any further questions in relation to the report? <coughs> Thank you. Moved Councillor Larry Baldock, seconded Mayor Gregory Brownless to it, of course, I will agree that it is an important part of our democracy, but it is clear that people do engage in it without real uh, intentions of, of you know, serious matters, and, and I think whilst it's treated currently in confidential, if the cost of that were presented to the public, they would be really, really aghast at the amount of money that gets wasted and, it, and there isn't any way to stop it from happening but it is a real serious concern that, that this does occur. Second to speak to the motion? Second to wish to speak to the motion? Any further speakers to the motion? Councillor Max Mason. Yes, there's um, in, in my opinion a, a, a gross um, abuse of the Lugoma system. Um, there are a probably a handful of people, and uh, I hope they are listening to this broadcast right now, because they're a complete waste of space and they add no value to our city. And the reason why I don't take those people seriously is because they are obsessively negative about the council. Some of those people are very smart, and if they um, had a more balanced view of life uh, and they gave the brickbats with the bouquets, 
then I think that uh, as councillors we would take them more seriously. Uh, because they're not being obsessively negative, we do not take them seriously and they're a waste of space to our community. Councillor, I would caution that while you're still an elected member, there are guidance under our code of conduct. Um, we, we just, I, I appreciate your frustration. I would support the substantive point that's being made I effectively by yourself and Council Bordock. I believe that as much as possible, it should be public. And those that comment with regard to democracy, of course, democracy is best done in the open as much as possible. So I understand, I think, the substantive point you're making. I would just caution about describing some members of our community the way you've described them. Just, I, but I appreciate, I appreciate the, how can I put it, the underlying passion you have for the city. Just caution. Any other speakers to the motion? Councillor Rick Kurak. I've thought about the uh, reference to posting on the website uh, the various names of people making requests, but before that's done, I'd just like some um, check done with the, I'm not sure, the, the ombudsman perhaps, or, or some entity that would, underst that would understand the actual spirit and intent of the goima, because potentially that could be a deterrent someone to ask questions of an organisation thinking that their name will be out there publicly and um, the subject of their question. So just before you do it, check with whoever the relevant body is and um, before you make the decision. Thank you. I, I have to sound confident that the management team would take the appropriate um, factors into consideration before they move somewhere and, and, and while your caution is, I'm sure, appreciated. I don't think it's particularly required in this instance. I, I'm sure full consideration will be given to the spirit of Lagoima and what we're trying to achieve. I, interesting enough, purely by coincidence, I have sitting in front of me a request from a concerned citizen about uh, an item and one of the specific points they make in writing in their email to me, which I received late last night, was please do not use my name. Um, so we, we do need to respect <coughs> Um, that there are some people in our community for whatever reason th their nature, their nurture or the stuff that's happened to them in their journey that their comfort with dealing with large and complex organisations who are often sometimes occasionally seen to be bureaucratic there's no irony that we were discussing earlier in this meeting the way we are seen by some members in our community and remember that if we score that midpoint there are some people who have a much lower view of us out there. So we do need to take this into account, but I'm sure the staff are well across that topic. Most of them, have, or many of them have been here much longer than we are or will be. Councillor Catherine Stewart. Thank you. Um, I don't have the same frustration as um, Councillor Baldock with regards to the community with Lagoima requests. Um, I think many of them are extremely valid and if they want to put in the energy and to find out the information then I think it's part of good democracy. I probably um, do have a frustration with code of conduct complaints and the costs imposed on ratepayers so I, that's where I find that frustrating but I don't with the um, wider public with Lagoima request. Recuse myself from any discussion around that for obvious reasons. Um, any further speakers to the motion on the table? In which case, Councillor Right of Reply, Councillor Bordock. Thank you. I was just trying to work out which one of your comments was your debate speech and which uh, was advice to Councillor Mason. But um, look, I, I don't have any problem with people having the right to find information. That's part of democracy. Uh, transparency is also something very important to democracy. So it goes two ways. If, if you want information, then there has to be a transparency as part of that too. Um, and that's what works. Democracy only works when people act responsibly. When they don't, people should know who are working, uh, acting responsibly and who are not, really. So um, that's, that was the only point I was raising. It's not about whether they can ask as many questions as they like. It's just simply whether that should be kept confidential or whether it should be transparent and everybody is able to see who that is.
Department of Education now will put the motion. The speaker having had the uh, move, having had the right of reply, will put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against. Abstentions. Carried. Um, it is now 12:07. There are two more items of business and open, which is the Mana Fenua and the chairperson's report. I propose that we do those after lunch and that we break for lunch now and are back here at one o'clock. You have 53 minutes.
welcome back colleagues. Um, the first item on the agenda this afternoon, reminding everyone we are still on open, is DC 245, the Manafenua Partnership Monitoring, Monitoring Report. Raki, the floor is yours. <coughs> Akio to Tato, through you, Mr. Chair. Noreda, Mihiana Kia, Kia Koto Katoa, Ngame Mo Tene, Kone Hira, Hirunga Te Kopapa o Tera, Noreda. Kamehi ake rā ki a koutou, ko tai mai nei ki te kōrero ki tēnei kaupapa ko au me ko Merilina. Mō tō māua reporta. And we are here to, if I shall sit down now, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā tāro katoa. So we are here to present our report on the for the monitoring report of the Tauranga Moana Tangata Whenua Collective or now known as the Mana Whenua Partnership or Tauranga Moana. Um, so in terms of the um, in terms of the item on the agenda I'm talking to, I guess it's page three, attachment A, DC 245, as per the heading that you can all see. And this is the way in which we report. We do our performance monitoring report back to the council for the year that ended 30 June uh, 2008. Um, I'm certainly not going to read all the words there. You can do that yourselves. But just to make comments as we work our way through it, if you like. Um, so on, on page one, these are fairly straightforward contractual requirements that through a, an agreement contract we have with the council each year that we're obliged to meet these uh, requirements and to report on them. Hence, this report. The first one is to provide the feedback. We make every effort to provide um, feedback back to Tauranga City Council within the negotiated frameworks. Now, those frameworks are basically, it is a, it is a program of work and of mahi, of projects that the council work with us, and I'm talking about the staff, work with the collective throughout the year. And we have monthly meetings with council as well as our own monthly meetings. So at least once a month for 11 times of the year, we meet with the council staff. They present um, project items to us, we discuss them, and we report back to them as required. Most of those presentations they make to us are on council issues that they want to get feedback from Tangata Whenua, and we do so accordingly. Um, we, could, we hope in the future for the next year to continue the what I believe is a good process that we follow, and um, I'm sure the council staff, um, when Meridina um, does her report, can comment on the things that we consult with. Um, moving down are the, are the very um, technicalities, if you like, points of that we follow the correct pre procedures as per, and of course we follow those as per standing orders of council that we have within our charter that we will, uh, we will um, follow the rules and regulations that we've agreed to in our, in our um, contract of agreement. And so you can see they're all ticks and yeses and we hope to maintain that record. Similarly, over the next page, again, it's the same sort of thing. 
we believe that we have a high standard as much as we can. One of the, I guess it's probably appropriate for me to comment at this stage that sometimes there, there are timing issues. Timing issues meaning that when we are meeting with council staff, we're there as a representative for our hapu within our ropu, our, our collective. And therefore, each hapu has its own way of dealing with the mandate that they pass on to their member representative. And sometimes some of those reps have to go back to their hapu to report. Their hapu don't report every week or month. Sometimes it could be bi-monthly. And so there's a timing thing in order to get some of the feedback back to um, the council staff. We also ensure that we do um, carry out our own requirements in terms of having our own meetings. In terms of our meetings, we stick to the protocol that we need to follow in terms of, again, set by council. And in terms of starting on time and apologies and having quorums and all that sort of stuff, we do that and we report on it. And here's the feedback for you. Over to the next page, the budget expenditure, we believe, has been um, slightly under for the year. When I say slightly, I guess I, I'm, 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 I'm saying it's actually about, um, as a percentage, it's probably about 4% under. It's $4,162 out of a total of 91600 So if you're a bit of a mathematician, that would... Um, probably work out to about 4.137%. And I quickly did in my head. It was a good guess. <laughs> anyway, um, that is what we've underspent under a little bit by. The reason being, we have um, for, for our meetings, and it is basically, there is a very um, comprehensive report which sets out every little item of expenditure and a in a very uh, accounting and reporting way. And if you looked at that, you will see that most of them come from the meetings. We have a set average number of meetings that we use in our budget, and sometimes we don't attain those for various reasons. One of them, we, have a, we had a bit of a, um, uh, it, was, it was early this year, in the first three months, we were with it for whatever reason, we had a lot of tangi in Tauranga which meant our members were away at their own tangi back at home. That has an effect on our meeting attendances. We have very little room of flexibility to change dates, etc. especially when it comes to council workshops. We can't say to them the day before or the day after, can we change it to next week because they've got staff ready to come along, etc. So we carry on. But um, it actually worked out, if you look at the numbers, it was less than one person on average per meeting per year. So everything else in the budget was either spot on or just a little bit over or a little bit under. Um, everything else is in the other issues. Now this covers special things that we did during the year. We have our normal program. We have a f our, uh, of our own. We have the normal program meeting with staff, but we have some special um, items that we do, and, the one, and one of them, well, the first one was to complete working through our, our strategic plan, and I believe that we have succeeded very well in terms of keeping to our work plan and <coughs> focusing on things, and I think that comes through to a certain extent in our relationship with Council through the um, Tangata Whenua Standing Committee in terms of our reporting there, and the record, I believe, is in those reports. Secondly, the disposal of the uh, TCC policy, disposal of surplus lands, and I think we're all aware of, what ha of where that's at. We spent quite a bit of time as a special project, if you like, working with council. We had a number of workshops separate to our own meetings, etc. And I believe we built up a very good relationship on that basis. Uh, it just wasn't quite ready to be signed off as we had hoped prior to the end of this year. But we've still got a month or two that we can do it, by the way. Anyway, that's up to you. Um, 
representation on Tauranga City Council committees. First of all, we started off with the previous um, uh, policy prior to Christmas, and there were there were six committees. We managed to end up with getting representatives on four of them during that short time, shortish time. I believe we had a we gave very good input. It provided a lot of uh, information and knowledge to councillors in that uh, I think it was about four or five months of time. And I believe our contribution was good from our point of view. And it was good for us to have a representative. Yeah. This year, it changed. There was a review of that particular policy and it was changed to four. Um, again, we, ended, we, 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 we now have four representatives on each of the, on, on, on those committees, one on each. We believe that we have the right calibre of um, representatives and I'm sure all your council members around the table um, uh, have seen that in terms of the, who we have there and we believe that it is working well. Um, we're getting the information back and I'm sure you're getting the benefit of their contribution in terms of input to those. Um, the other one is the name. Well, it was a biggie for us. It might not sound a big thing. It'd be like changing Tauranga City to uh, something else. But, you know, and so we managed to come up with, well, we managed to settle on this name um, in terms of mana whenua, mana whenua being people of the land in that specific area. And therefore, we believe that's more appropriate than Tangata Whenua can mean a general name, for, other name for Māori, if you like in areas. Um, we're actually now looking at a slight tweak to that, if you like, and we are going to uh, uh, put that through as soon as we can, and that is, we felt that, I don't want to dwell on this, but it is significant to us, we, we wanted to get the name to be all in Māori, in Te Reo. So we looked at the word partnership and thought, well, you know, we've got all those other lovely Māori words, but we've got partnership at the end or in the middle or wherever it is. And so we have come up with another word, and I'm giving you a preview on it right now, and the word is ranga pū. R-A-N-G-A-P-U with one of those stick things, macrons, over the U, and you, which means it's a W or you pronounce it long. And what that means is a, is a is sort of like a company of people coming together. You could use that in today's world when you use, use the word Smith & Smith Company Limited company would be the rangapu, okay? So that's a basic, very basic translation. It means other things in Māori of a forum, uh, um, I'm trying to think of an English word, um, a congregation for a purpose, this sort of thing, okay? So we're working on that now and hopefully we'll have something ready by tomorrow. No, it'll be, we're working on it. Over the page, the last page, uh, significantly, last year we went to the National Māori, uh, National Housing Conference for Māori in Hamilton last year. It runs by, by Enil. Um, we had it, if you can recall, uh, about two years ago, and that, again, was very beneficial to see what's happening in the rest of the country regarding housing development for Māori right across the board. Um, engaged with important things like the FDS and TUS and plan changes, which has been a significant thing that we have contributed to and in inputting to with, with council and those special project teams that were set up. And uh, more recently, we're looking at the naming policy, and which I'm reporting on this because it started in last year's um, program and we're still working on it. And of course, the one of my favourites, the Aranga Design Principles. We believe that by, that is a great thing that can uh, then greatly benefit the city and has been proven in some of the biggest cities throughout Aotearoa. And um, we, of course, finally, we always like to ensure that we can um, improve our relationship with council through our workshop process. Um, Ko Fakamituku uh, uh, Fakamitu Taku Ripoata, Kia Kato, Kia Tate Kato, Nore da Tina Kato, Tina Kato, Tina Tate Kato, here part time. Any questions?
Councillor Rikurik. Thank you, uh, Pataki. <coughs> you spoke of the name change. Apart, um, was there anything that went along with that name change in terms of the you know, principles, kaupapa, stuff like that? Or was it just purely a name change with nothing else, no other changes? In terms of the MO, you know, well, how you operate. The okay, Councillor, um, correct? Yep. I think I did mention that uh, the words, mana whenua versus tangata whenua. The, the more correct wording, we believe, is mana whenua. Mana whenua means the rights and privileges of that specific piece of land, rights of that land. Tangata whenua means people of the land. In other words, the indigenous people, Māori people, are tangata whenua of this country, or of the city, or of this region, or whatever. Okay, mana whenua uh, um, is specific to a very clearly defined piece of land, and that is the boundaries with that define Tauranga City Council. So that defines closer your mandate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank the you. other that's that's basically the main um, concept regarding the change. Um, now, also just looking at the report. Um, you refer to, in terms of 11 Mission Street, and sorry I've lost the page, um, you refer to agreeing to the, or supporting the agreement uh, between Ultimataha Trust and the Elms. Is that just in principle, um, not in, of course, the details, so it's a principle of an agreement? Hello. Oh, through you, Mr Chair, I... I didn't specifically mention that, 11 Mission Street. That is another kaupapa outside of this collective, or um, rangapū. <laughs> um, that is a more to do with the specific mana whenua of Otamataha. Hmm. I'd love to carry on that discussion if I've got about another two hours. Councillor Max Mason. Thank you for your presentation. Um, <coughs> just following on from that, I was just, um, uh, just I guess a subtlety on the mana whenua is, um, so Nai Tamawaraho, how, how, how do you describe, describe them as the, as, as the, as the more specific uh, mana whenua? Yeah, because, for example, the, uh, as the hapu, um, they're often um, seen as being the, 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 the people of the land in, in, in that respect, in a more closely, or is that more just in this particular section of Tauranga? Uh, Councillor Mason, and I, uh, are you asking in respect of which piece of Whenua? I guess so. Is that <coughs> because if, for example, there's a uh, an opening um, at the gallery, for example, it would be the Nai Tamawaraho elders would come uh, and 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 do the blessing. Um, yeah. So so what what is the is that is that just specific to this particular peninsula, or um, how how would you see that in terms of the the the, the, the mana of that of that um, hapu? Um. Look, in terms of specific areas, you're, you're right in saying, yes, it is specific to a particular piece, like if it was uh, down the mount, it would be somebody else, and et cetera, et cetera. But in this particular instance, Tamarawa will have, have the uh, responsibility of, uh, and, the, and to do those things. However, within the protocols which determine which, which hapu have mana whenua, there is another hapu in this area that could, if they so wish, however, in certain circumstances, the other hapu, i.e. Ngāti Tapu, defers to Tamarawaho to do it. It doesn't mean to say it lessens our, our mana whenua, but um, things that happen over here because we're over at Marapi, we, we, they, they do it on our behalf. Hence, the the relationship between the two hapu which really come together in that most significant part of the city which is the Otamata relationship which is not just a bit on top but around that immediate vicinity of area 
But yes, they exercise that right under the um, agreement of other of the other hapu or other hapu who who give their um, consent. Question, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> is um, I'm not sure if you've seen in the annual report um, on page 242. There's the working with Tangata Fenua. Ha has the partnership um, currently still? Ha have I presume that Mererina and, and the and the unit Tangata unit wrote that. Ha has the partnership endorsed that? Is it is it a is it all backed up? I think in in general terms, yes. In terms of this exact wording specifically of this report, um, it, it's something that is that the that the uh, Takawanga put together, but based on the all the other things that we agree with. But in terms of the actual wording, no. I have. Councillor Leanne Brown. Thanks, Poharaki. Um, just a question. Um, <clears throat> was the um, partnership involved at all in the naming of Te Papa Onamono Paratakataka um, or any of the, um, have any input into that particular project at all or was that specifically just the hapu? Um, the hapu. Basically, we were aware of it. We uh, gave our support to the hapu to do what they felt was best. Moving along, I had an indication from Carlo Ellis' staff to speak just before he does. I'm happy to hear Carlo's contribution. Councillor Kurak, the page you asked, I believe was page 93. It's appendix or attachment B to DC 245. That's where there's explicit reference made to the words 11 Mission Street, if that's what you're looking for earlier. Carlo, you have a, something you wish to add? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and through you. I just thought a couple of comments might help with clarity. So just in terms of mana whenua as a reference, with the mana whenua uh, rangapu or, or mana whenua partnership, where that comes from is mana whenua across the area of land that Tauranga City Council presides over. So it's matching over that and basically what you've got is a group of 17 hapu and iwi in there that recognise and claim mana whenua across that area. And then as you get into specific projects, you might identify into a particular place and then it becomes more specific. So we do have all the mapping layers that are agreed across the hapu as to where different boundaries are, and then there's also crossovers of those boundaries where we expect people to talk to. So just so you get a sense of that, mana whenua partnership is all of those uh, hapu and iwi that are recognised both um, to and from each other to have mana whenua over our Tauranga City Council boundaries. And if we have any particular project, so if there's a project that turned up in uh, the Te Papa Peninsula here, then we would involve those mana whenua who have expressed interest on their maps in that particular area. So if we come back to Te Papa o Manuporo Takataka, then the hapu that have expressed that mana whenua in that area are Ngai Tukairangi and Ngati Kuku. So they're the ones that, we, that the project team would work with in particular to there. We try and still have that informed back across to the mana whenua partnership so that they're aware of it. But as Puhiraki has rightly pointed out, um, you know, unless there's something glaring, it uh, would generally be supported because that hapu has mana whenua in their own particular area. So I hope those couple of things will help. Just from the chair, kind of, in our mapping, in our council website we have mapping, which is enormously important. How accessible is the mapping of those layers of hapu mana whenua status across the territorial authorities area, are they accessible easily via the mapping part of Tauranga City Council's website? Would it be helpful if they were readily accessible? I'm, I'm not sure if they're publicly accessible, and I've actually asked the question, so I'm just waiting for that to come back on another matter. 
Um, but what I would say is definitely there's been open discussion with Mana Whenua Partnership about sharing those, for example, with our neighbouring two councils to assist them in trying to um, have that resource to guide some of their connections with people. Uh, so that offer has been made from the Mana Whenua Partnership to share their boundaries. I also know that there's some other entities that are interested in having access to that, but we're yet to actually ask the Mana Whenua Partnership if they're okay to share that information across. Um, the other level of that is if we get inquiries through the Takawangi unit or, or through any of our other ones, and in particular mainly the property um, the property group, then um, we, we are happy to share those. So we'll often provide those uh, that advice or those layers and maps, depending on what people's query is, we, we're pretty sharing about that. And usually what we'll do is go back to the mana whenua and say, hey, somebody's inquiring about this. Are you okay for us to share your boundaries with them and clear it that way? I mean, I think reflecting on earlier conversations about transparency and, and just understanding, people understanding perhaps the history, again, referred to earlier in this meeting of this place, if the more we can put readily accessible, the more people come to understand it, appreciating the levels of complexity. If you've been here for 700 years, there's a fair bit of complexity in those relationships and those boundaries and how one communicates that. But if it could be, the more we could put out there to help people understand, the better. Councillor Leanne Brown, have I got? Possibly not question, maybe observation. I'm just going through some paperwork at home and I found a really good map that the regional council have done around all the hapu and iwi. It's in a big fold out map. It's really, really good. It tells you who, what, where. Um, and the other question, I guess, is on in our annual report, pages 252 and 253, we've referred to the Tangata Whenua um, Committee, so would it be fair that that should actually now have reflect the new name? I know it's changed during that during that year, but if we wanted to be current, those those references should actually be to the Mana Whenua. Okay, I'll note that in my changes for staff. Point well made, Councillor. I noticed in the agenda we refer to Anthony as the Tangata Whenua representative rather than the now Mana Whenua representative. So these small points, we will miss you, Councillor, if you choose to stick to your word and not change your mind. Any further questions in relation, Councillor Rick Kurek? No, I'm, I'm unsure if this is uh, the relevant section of the report that we're talking about here, but and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for pointing out the page 93 where it does refer to Mission Street. Now, uh, Fuharaki, it says here that you asked uh, the members of the partnership to support um, the Otamataha Trust uh, position. So, given you're also on the Alms Trust as well, right? No, you are, yeah. So, that was. Um, to a degree, wearing the Alms hat too or not? I'm just trying to establish where that recommendation for support came from. Was it purely uh, Mana Whenua uh, partnership relation or, the, or representing the Alms position also? Can you give us some bit of background? Where's that come from? Yes, I understand what you're saying. I guess that comes when uh, certain individuals wear too many have too many responsibilities. However, um, yes, I am a member of, uh, I am a, a trustee on the Elms, but in that instance, it was purely as the chairperson, well, sorry, from the Mana Whenua partnership point of view, 100% specifically because the, the Otamataha Trust represents the two hapu of Ngai Tamarawaho and Ngati Tapu. And through their representatives. I do not actually represent my hapu on the Mana Whenua Collective uh, Partnership, but through those representatives, the the request was put through to, through the partnership which I chair for them to get support from the members. It came from the two representatives of the hapu. So it was in response to that that as the chair I allowed that to carry on and therefore it was also that um, the way it's written there I think you said that I personally asked them or was that correct councillor correct it says uh, or was, did the collective was asked to uh, 
uh, in Sayyid Furak, he explained the Uttamataha Trust position and asked uh, the partnership members to oh, support. Right, yes. Yeah. Yes, that was true. But as, um, yeah. Councillor Terry Malloy. Mana Fenu or Tauranga Moana Rangapu has um, has a, a quite a good ring, but what what do we insert there in the place of the chairman? What would be the appropriate insertion if, if we're if we're using the uh, the Tangata Fenua? Um? If you have to put the word chairman in there to, as a describing the position of someone, you would say you would use the word. Either tiamana or hiamana can be can mean either can mean the chairman. So it's tia hiamana or tia tiamana or tia and then carry on. Recently, Very good. chairman of the blah blah blah. Yep. Th th thank you for that. The other one is um, I just want to comment. Very good representatives we've got on the uh, on the six committees. Um, the, the calibre there I think is um, is fantastic, and they're making a, a, a great contribution. Four, sorry, okay, at this stage. Um, the, the other uh, question I'd like to ask is, with engagement and consultation, especially on significant issues, ha have we got those protocols right as to as ha how we go about it? Um, that's a that's a biggie. Um, Sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes somewhere in between. Um, it depends on the, um, without looking at specific examples, I could if I, if I had to, but it depends on the size and sensitivity of the issue that's being dealt with um, because sometimes within our relationship we have a definition of how say, for example, how council will interact with um, tangata whenua. But within tangata whenua tikanga itself, there are different, different hapu have different ways of dealing with issues. And so we need to be very cognizant and, and, and know exactly when we're dealing with a particular hapu or group that we are sticking to the or we're adhering to correct tikanga process in that sense. Now, that's from a tikanga point of view. Now, in terms of the way in which council has carries out their tikanga, well then, that could, um, that is a very challenging way that um, at times we, we, again, we interact with council. I wouldn't say it's a, the, the more significant or I, s I use the word sensitive because it's not necessarily something that is seen to be a biggie but it is to Māori and so it's that sensitivity that we need to get better at it and I mean from both sides too hmm. Are there any further questions colleagues to staff to Puvaragi in which case we have a recommended motion in your agenda. Do I have a mover for the motion, please? Moved Councillor Terry Malloy, seconded, seconded Councillor Kelvin Clout. Speaking to the motion, Councillor. I have very little to say, but um, I, I believe with our, our relationship with the, uh, the Tangata Whenua over uh, Taranga Moana, that is, uh, continuing to get stronger and to improve um, year on year and um, I just look forward to that continuing. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora Puraraki and uh, thank you to you and the whole um, the partnership, the, the collective that we enjoy dealing with. Um, certainly I believe that um, the relationship we have does add value to the work that we do in uh, in the Kunihira uh, or Tauranga Moana. So um, thanks again, and looking forward to continuing that uh, work in the next um, three years. 
Uh, and I particularly would like to see this right of first refusal sorted out um, very soon in the in the new trainium. That'll be something I'd like to um, press for. Thank you. Councillor Larry Bulldock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Puharaki. Um, I think um, when we look at the report here and we see, you know, how much, how how many times through the um, year you must engage and we must engage, I think we get an understanding of the enormous amount of work that is done in this relationship. And I just wanted to acknowledge that, that it's um, unlike we who are sitting here full times, you know, in jobs, um, many people who come to represent mana whenua position, you know, are not as we are um, tasked with a full-time responsibility, and much of it is done, don't, you know, with a lot of voluntary time and effort. Uh, yes, we pay meeting fees and so on, but, you know, it's a very minimal budget, really, and, and the amount of engagement, which is necessary, it's, it's, it's part of, and as the Local Government Act says, improving decision-making on behalf of Maori, and we value that, and we would, I think, probably like to convey back to the Mana Whenua or Tauranga Mamana Partnership, and I'll try and learn that new word very soon, um, that we appreciate it. Councillor Leanne Brown. Uh, thank you, and thank you, um, Pohaki, and also to Meridina and the work that you do. And in speaking of you and your team, I just want to actually acknowledge Carlo Ellis and the work that he does for us. Um, he's a bit of a gatekeeper. He also um, helps us address the elephant in the room at times. And um, he helps stimulate conversation and also encourage honesty amongst us. And I think that's gone a long way to helping our relationship with mana whenua improve, be open and honest. And uh, yeah, I think it's in a really good place going forward. So thank you, Carl, for your work. Councillor Max Mason. Yeah, just uh, again, just to reiterate the uh, great thanks to, to, the, to, the, to the committee and the partnership and also to the uh, Tautuanga team, uh, Marina and uh, Carlo and, and, uh, and colleagues um, doing a fantastic job and <coughs> it's really great to see um, the last few years um, things have really um, developed and, and, and uh, there's some, some big big things have happened. There's a, a big one coming up in the next few weeks um, and let's hope that uh, goes uh, goes well um, and uh, just been a pleasure working with you and uh, really uh, wish you a lot of, you know, all success in the future. Thank you. Further speakers to the motion? I'm happy to support the motion. I would note that last triennium there was created somewhat informally a new unit of currency in the city of Tauranga and it was a botanical house, a glass house up on Cliff Road and the discussion around the cost of that was circa $100,000 per annum. And I would note that the budget that you reported on Puharaki is less than we spend per annum on the maintenance of that small glass building on that park. Less than one glass house. For the record. Happy to support the motion. The move of the motion wish to speak and reply. In which case I'll put the motion. All those in favour please say aye. Against, abstentions, carry. Thank you. We now move to the last item um, on the open agenda, and that's the chairperson's report. And I was sorely tempted, but having resisted the temptation for the part of the triennium that I've been here, it would not serve anyone well for me to succumb. So my chairperson's report is short. I would like to thank my colleagues for the way they've worked in this chamber on this committee. It is a tough job we do. We don't always agree politically and I would be lying if I said our personalities were always wonderful fits but generally speaking, we've stayed by and large in a professional space, which is the space we must work
for the benefit of all the people in the city. I would like to thank the staff for their support and hard work in my time as deputy to Kelvin Clout and in his, my time as chair of the Finance, Audit and Risk Committee. In that respect, as chair, I would like to thank Mayor Gregory Brownless for having the confidence in me to put me in this position. It's appreciated. I would like to thank the senior management team who won as chair, and those of you who have been chairs know you work closely with and give you enormous support in sort of successfully holding down the responsibilities of chair. And last and not least, and not only because they write the minutes of the meetings, I would like to give my sincere thanks to the government staff. <laughs> that ends the open section of this committee meeting. I would now like to move from the chair that we move into public excluded. I have a seconder, Councillor Larry Baldock. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, abstentions carried. We'll take a couple of minutes pause.